morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. For the record, uh, my name is Erin Murphy, at-large city councilor, and I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Strong Women, Families, and Communities. Today is April 1st, 2024. This hearing is being recorded. It is also being live-streamed at boston.gov slash city dash council dash tv and broadcast on xfinity channel 8 rcn channel 82 fios channel 964 written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.health at boston.gov and will be made part of the record and available to all of the counselors public testimony will be taken at the end of this hearing individuals will be called on in the order in which they signed up and will have two minutes to testify. If you're interested in testifying in person, please add your name to the sign-in sheet at the door near the entrance of the chamber. And if you're looking to testify virtually, you will need to email Central Staff Liaison, Megan Cavanaugh, which is M-E-G-H-A-N dot K-A-V-A-N-A-G-H at boston.gov for the link and your name will be added to the list. Today's hearing is on docket 0509, in order for a hearing to review programming available for seniors in the city of Boston. Which is always a good conversation to have. Um, this matter was sponsored by Councilors Enrique Pepin, Ben Weber, and Louis, Councilor Louis Jean, and was referred to the committee on the meeting on March 13th, 2024. Today, I am joined by my colleagues in order of arrival, the lead sponsors, Councillor Weber, Councillor Pepin, Councillor Louis Jean, and I'm also joined by Councillor Coletta and Councillor Braden. Before we start with opening remarks, I do know that we had a long list of panelists, and I just want to confirm from the administration side who's here. Um, so I know we have Emily Shea, the commissioner, thank you. Jose Masso, thank you for coming down. Um, and Taisha, awesome. Taisha Jones Warner, so you are the Age Strong Commission, the Director of Events and Programming. Correct. Yes, and Allison Freeman, okay, Program Manager. Perfect. So you'll be first. We do have a second panel, and we may have um, you know, community chime in at some point. We've also been joined, thank you, by Councilor Mejia. And with that being said, um, as a woman in my mid-50s, my parents, my dad is 91 now, my mom is getting older, my grandparents lived into a wonderful old age. Um, so seniors are close to, to me and to our community, and it's important that we get it right. And I know recently we had the hearing where we went through a lot of grants and Something I knew, but it was reminded at that hearing the amazing work your department, like your commission does for our aging residents. Um, just seeing the pictures from the play the other night in Brighton with our seniors and knowing that the different centers that have standalone senior programming or all of the BCYF and other programming we do offer throughout the city is important, but at the same time, and I think we all love that our seniors are advocates for themselves, which is wonderful. And they're the first to call you and remind you if there's something they want to make sure that we're offering them. So kudos to our seniors who um, are a wonderful role model to the younger generation that you need to advocate for yourself. And I know that um, I'll pass it off to the lead sponsors, but that definitely when I'm in community and I'm at either you know Keystone or places that are senior only or also just different, um, you know, the supermarket and they come over, the concerns they have or the needs they have are something I know that we want to continue to uplift. So this hearing will hopefully get us to the end where we know going into budget season, what are we doing and what do you need to expand those offerings to our seniors. So thank you very much and I will pass it off to Councillor Weber. Thank you. Uh, th yeah, thank you, Chair Murphy. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the panelists for being here today and my colleagues and co-sponsors, um, uh, Councillor Pepin uh, and Council President Louis Jen uh, for, for sponsoring this. 
Um, I filed this hearing order to learn more about the day programming that the city offers to seniors uh, and if that program is accessible and equitably available uh, for all of our seniors across the city. I also want to applaud programs in my district uh, like JP at Home and the West Roxbury Pop-Up Senior Center, um, uh, both operated by Ethos. Uh, you know, they've stepped up to the plate and provided our seniors uh, with you know, a, a great set of activities. And you know, I think you know, as a city, it's our obligation to make sure those activities continue. Um, I know that given this, the recent state budget cuts, um, that will make it challenging uh, for us to continue to provide our seniors with those services. And I, I first want to thank um, you know, H-Strong Commissioner Emily Shea uh, for, for all uh, that she is doing uh, to provide services for our seniors across the city and, and want to work in partnership uh, to close any gaps that may exist that prevent senior programming from happening. Uh, what the pandemic has taught us is that our seniors need uh, a sense of community uh, they need to be mobile and need to be engaged with one another in order uh, uh, to age in place and uh, live their best lives. I hope today we can discuss ways to make this possible for uh, our seniors across the city and uh, I welcome any solutions that we can consider to best serve you know, our seniors. Thank you. Thank you, Council Weber. Council Pepper. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panelists for being here today. Thank you to the lead sponsor, Council Weber, for proposing this, putting this on the table, because it's the topic that is also very important in my district. Um, district 5 is home to a very high percentage of adults that are older than 65 years old. And when that article came out that the state is planning on cutting the budget by $10.7 million, um, it did cause a lot of anxiety in residents. As you all are aware, there isn't a senior center in my district. Um, there are a lot of seniors that feel like they don't have a place to connect with others. Um, but before I continue with saying that, I do want to give a quick shout out, like Councilor Weber said, to people like Valerie Frias from Ethos, uh, Michelle Consalvo from Ethos, um, Ms. Barbara Crutchlow, who runs an amazing program at the Mildred Community Center. And every Tuesday and Thursday, that room is packed of seniors, not only from my district, but across the city. So shout out to the work that they do. But I know that they're their outreach is, is spread thin because there isn't that place where people can, can go to. So I'm very excited for the conversation to have here today. Hopefully there's, there's a productive conversation because I think the se seniors deserve it. Um, I also want to highlight the fact that in my district, in Hyde Park specifically, we have two brand new developments coming to the neighborhood. The Pride, which is the first in the nation LGBTQ friendly senior housing, um, and then 1201 River Street which is another, well, 55 plus senior housing, um, but it's two amazing opportunities and they're right next to the Hyde Park Muni, the Municipal Center. So hopefully we can chat about some potential senior resources going into that building considering they'll have some new neighbors. But that's why I decided to co-sponsor this because it's a very important topic. But again, very thankful for having you here today and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Council President Lujan. Thank you, and I want to thank uh, members of the administration for being here. Uh, Councillor Weber, I want to thank you for filing this. Um, this is a matter that matters most to everyone. Um, my, my district colleagues are saying it matters to everyone in their district, and it matters to everyone in my district too, which is the entire city of Boston, uh, because our, as the hearing order states, approximately 12.3% of our city is um, our, our, our aging adults. And, um, you all are doing a fantastic job of uh, helping us meet their needs. Um, the joy on the face of our seniors at any event is just beyond. I just like, I don't want to go anywhere. I want to stay all day and talk to them and learn from them and hear from their wisdom. But it also shows you how important it is for us to be creating space for them. Um, and it's something that if we're all lucky enough, we'll all experience what it means to age and what it means to um, uh, be older and creating an environment that we want to see, I think, is the model. Um, so I want to say thank you for that. It's, it's, it's something that folks have uh, organized. I remember I put this in for ARPA for there to be an allocation for senior pro programming. After speaking to our aging adults at the Keystone and hearing from them and their incredible advocacy, uh, shout out to Jan Hamilton here and Dot in West Roxbury who have been advocating, who are organized and advocating for a senior center there. And we went, a lot of us went there recently and just saw the need and just saw the love and doing chair yoga um, 
And the pandemic also showed us the, the toll that loneliness can have on, on us as individuals, but even more so for our seniors who feel isolated. I understand that, we, you know, I'd love to hear from you what the, if, if money weren't a constraint, what the vision would be. And then given that money is a constraint, what is the vision and how are we working towards meeting the goals? I know that the folks here in Castle Weber's district are incredibly organized. Um, those at the Mildred, shout out to Barbara, um, uh, Chris Lowe, and, and all those who are organized are just in different, in Mattapan and around our city. But I'd love to hear the, sort of what the vision is, um, where we are now, and what the wish list is. Because obviously it's for West Roxbury, it's for Southwest uh, Boston, but it's for other places as well. And so I just want to thank you again for your work. I want to thank my colleagues because I think this is something that unifies us all, whether it be in West Roxbury or Roxbury or Mattapan, that we want to make sure that we're taking care of those who took care of us. So thank you. Thank you. And we've been joined by Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Santana, and Councilor Flynn. Like the rats, I think the seniors, when we have a hearing on seniors, we get everyone to come and advocate, so this is great. Um, next for opening statements is Councilor Coletta. Oh. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all so much for your work. Hello, hi, good morning. Um, seniors, I mean, it's, it's gonna be said a million times over, but seniors have dedicated their lives to uplift their families, uh, support their families, but also our communities, and so they deserve the absolute best for those who are listening in. Um, we have a whole new generation that is emerging, is going to retire, and they have different priorities. Um, they are finding different ways to find camaraderie and companionship uh, beyond bingo. <laughs> And a lot of them have said, while we love bingo, they want to focus in on their health and wellness. So are we investing our resources in a very um, uh, helpful way, productive way that meets their needs and meets their priorities? And so that's something I would love to, to hear from you all. But just want to thank you all for your work. Thank the various tapestry of, of organizations, ABCD, uh, some of the organizations in East Boston. And, um, talk about the East Boston Senior Center and how great it is and, and talk about what it took to get that off the ground, even to have a shovel uh, in the ground. So happy to be here and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Coletta. Councilor Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here this morning. I'm very excited to have this conversation this morning. Um, we have, um, we're very blessed to have the Veronica Smith Senior Center in Alston Brighton. Um, as, a, as, a, as a former firehouse and converted into a, used to be a municipal centre and now it's a senior centre and also has the Brighton and Austin Heritage Museum downstairs if you're ever over there it's always worth a visit. Um, just to say um, Bostonians are the remit is to um, our seniors are 55 years and older. Well, I can put myself squarely in that department right now at the moment. And also to remember that we have, it's three generations. You have 55-year-olds up to 100-year-olds. So, and many of our, gener um, our seniors are taking care of um, aging parents. Uh, they're also helping to take care of um, youngsters, the next generation coming behind. So um, I think it's really... Um, as we found out, and, and a big shout out to Lauren Basler and Jackie, the executive director at the Veronica Smith and also Jackie McLaughlin, they put on some great programs. As anyone who attended this St. Patrick's Day party can attest, it's definitely a hopping over there. Everybody's having a lot of fun. And they did, their, they put, did a dramatic performance the other evening and I wasn't, unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend, missed it completely. But, um, you know, they're, do, they're really uh, working very creatively to provide programming, and as as as, as Lauren says, you know, uh, offering a wide range of different programs is very important because not everyone wants to do bingo, but there's something sort of little something for everyone, and there's people who just come in for specific types of programs like the the painting program or the or the tai chi or the yoga, or blah, whatever. There's different different people are, are drawn in. The also the other thing that I'd really like to raise up is the incredible amount of talent and experience that our elder our seniors have, um, and not everyone wants to um, they want to be active in their retirement. So finding ways to continue to have ways that they can contribute to the growth and the development of our uh, city and to nurture and uh, mentor the next generation uh, of our younger younger kids uh, coming in is so much need. Uh, for folks to help with mentoring and, and homework. I think this, I'm very into thinking about intergenerational programming and ways we can support elders uh, to, um, 
get the respect they need. Like in some cultures, a veneration of your elders is incredibly important. I don't think we do that so well in the United States. But also um, to have elders pass on that wisdom and that knowledge to uh, the younger generation coming along. Um, anyway, I have questions, and, and I'm not going to talk anymore. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Councillor Mejia? Thank you, Chair. I just looked at Councillor Braden. Did you look at my notes? I wrote on. <laughs> I, I, I love that. I love that we're all on the same um, wavelength here. So I am going to um, ditto some of the things that Councillor Breeden just um, mentioned. I just wanted, before I start, to say thank you all. I think your department brings the greatest joy to so many of our, our seniors who are uh, oftentimes experiencing isolation. So whether it's the St. Patty's, whether it's African American you know, History Month, or whatever the case is, it's like it is so great to see them in community with each other, having a good time. And I think, you know, Councilman Breeden and I also get to dance and enjoy ourselves too. So I think everybody is um, enjoying the programming. I, I think I just wanna highlight a few things, you know, um, one is around the 55 and over. I think that oftentimes, as we're thinking about seniors, there's, I think we have an opportunity to create some more programming, especially a lot of our um, grandparents who are raising children um, and grandchildren and things of that nature. So I, I'd love to hear a little bit more programming and what we're doing to support parents, grandparents who are parenting. Um, the whole idea of intergenerational programming, I think it's really important. And Chief Maso, I think that there's an opportunity there for um, creating some more integrated programming where youth are teaching elders and elders are teaching youth and so that all it's not just in the age strong budget but that they were sharing the the pie a little bit I would love to hear some what that looks like and then workforce development a lot of our um, elders are that even though they're ready, they retire they're not ready to retire they want to work and I think we have an opportunity and this is where I think as the city we need to start thinking about our coordinated efforts like where can we pull resources from our violence prevention strategy? Grandparents and elders can be a part of that conversation. Workforce development, what type of pipelines are we, are we creating for even for them to start their own businesses? I have grandparents who have called my office who wanna start a cleaning company and they're ready to go. Um, and I think that oftentimes they don't know how to navigate, so I'd love to hear some innovation around that. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say is that during COVID, our office works. Um, alongside a lot of the adult daycares um, and as well as some of the senior housings and we created um, programming for culturally competent foods as well as um, art healing programs and what we realized is that those art healing sessions we've had a art therapist who comes in and does some paint um, nights with some of our elders and we've been doing this in collaboration with nonprofit organizations but it would be great to hear a little bit about how you all are are tackling trauma for our elders and the what role that um, arts plays, and that's another department. So I think at the end of the day, the bottom line is, is that we are resource rich and coordination poor. And I think when we're talking about our seniors, we need to tap into every single little budget and department to see where can we pull some resources to support our elders. And so that's what I'd love to hear a little bit about. I'll be pumping in and out because I do have a 1030, but I'll be listening in and I'll be coming back for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Councilor Fernandez-Anderson. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Just a heads up, I have to step out at 11 for a meeting, but I will come back as well. Um, so this is, this is uh, I have a similar file for District 7 specific. Good morning, Chief, Commissioner, uh, Ms. Uh, I never call you by your last name. Jones Horner, Director Jones Horner. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Allison, um, there you are. Um, Ms. Freeman, um, thank you all for being here. This conversation as you've, you're hearing here is extremely important to us. Um, one of, so I didn't know this hearing was happening, but the intention I think that uh, the filer had was to actually combine my filing with his and we all get so busy and you can see how there's a disconnect. So when I saw this on the calendar this morning, I was like, oh, let me rush into that and hopefully infuse myself into it so that it's one conversation. Um, and I think considering this the hearing for my file would be great. Um, and so 
my focus specifically, and I've worked with, I've worked with specifically, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with a program called that uh, paid by Medicaid. Is it Medicaid or Medicare for seniors? Is it called Medicare when you're senior specific? Medicare. Um, thank you. So uh, it's specifically by Medicare and it's called a community um, services programs um, by MassHealth and others that um, ta that that uh, would pay like sort of, you know, um, uh, contractors or, or providers to uh, provide services to seniors and it's specific to seniors with mental health or seniors with disabilities or seniors that are just needing supports. And so throughout that, my, my experience and my, my overall like uh, public health is like 27 years of experience, um, uh, full transparency, starting with this beautiful woman s sitting here, um, Ms. Jones Horner, uh, my first job, I was, we were 13 together. Um, and so uh, the, the level of services that are missing that we, you know, we can we can do events, we can do all of these other types of like uh, sort of supplemental services, but the level of care and services that are missing um, is really uh, heart dampening uh, to say the least. And as as you you campaign, you go through people's doors, and seniors are sad in general is what I'm hearing. Um, people are depressed. Um, people tell you I'm I feel alone. Um, and a lot of my stops were in tears. Um, a lot of them were, you know, let me, let me pray for you, you know, little sis, but a lot of them, um, a lot of my aunties and uncles are out there and they are sad. And so all of this in com combination with my experience and expertise, I feel like it's a, a, just a lack of addressing seniors and meeting with them where they are. Um, and because they're such a they're forgotten population, you know this more than I do. You're the experts in this. I applaud what you're doing. You have a huge undertaking. Um, so my conversation is going to be specific to District Seven, um, but looking at not just you know adult daycare, not just a center where they can go. I think there are creative solutions to this. Um, outdoor recreational space, indoor, there are buildings that are blight in our district that we can take and renovate to actually create recreational. And I'm not just talking about, again, you know, bingo and stuff like that. Um, I'm talking about ways that seniors can actually look into uh, contributing and being a part of society, as you've heard from my colleagues. So. Um, this is uh, uh, hopefully uh, hoping for a robust conversation, but this is extremely important to me. Uh, seniors are my favorite people, creatures of all humans. Um, and I actually do a senior tour in my district where every Friday I spend about two to three weeks, three, two to three hours with them. And so I go from senior home to senior home, a program to program every single Friday. And we eat, we talk, we laugh, we joke. Um, but mostly it's about taking down their grievances and here and listening to them. Um, as a city councilor, you could see that that's not conventional, but um, I find it extremely helpful to guide policies and projects or programs in District 7. So thank you so much for being here and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Councilor Santana. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you to the lead sponsors for um, bringing this hearing order. Um, and thank you to our panelists. I'm so glad to see so many familiar faces. Um, you know, I'll keep my remarks short. And I, I, I think I want to reiterate, you know, a couple of the things that my previous um, colleagues have mentioned. Um, you know, I grew up in Mission Hill, and um, right, right, Mission Hill, the Mission Park serves a lot of our, um, you know, a lot of our seniors that that, that live in Mission Hill. So, um, got to spend a lot of time growing up there, and um, as a former director of the Mission Hill Summer Program. Um, I used to do a lot of um, cross collaboration, cross um, intergenerational programming. And I know Councillor Braden and Councillor Mejia just brought that up. And I think that's one of the, um, you know, some of the questions that I'll ask today in terms of um, what opportunities are we creating and, um, you know, how can we as a city council um, be supportive of that. Um, I think it's very important for um, our youth um, and, and, and our seniors to really get together. And I'm really glad to see um, Chief Mosso here who, who does a lot of, a lot of work with, with our youth. Um, 
The other piece I, you know, I, I like to bring up today is um, transportation. Um, you know, as an at-large city councilor, I, I get to spend time in every single neighborhood. Um, and one of the things that really comes up is, you know, I really want to be able to do this, where I, uh, but I can't get there, or um, you know, I have to wait for this bus, or I, whatever the case may be. Um, and I want to make sure that, you know, kind of want to learn w what you are doing um, for transportation, and again, what what can we do to better support that? Um, and then, the, you know, the last thing I, I want to touch on is um, just food access. Um, I know Councilor Mejia has mentioned, you know, during the pandemic, I was also very active during the pandemic of delivering, um, you know, food directly to our senior homes, and um, and I think that hasn't stopped, right? The, the food insecurity hasn't stopped just because we're, you know, past the pandemic. So want to learn more of just of the work that you are doing, and I know you are all doing incredible work, but. Um, want to know how you know we as city council can can support that work more. So, um, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Council Santana, Council Flynn. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your work on supporting our seniors throughout Boston, along with the other files of a, of this uh, important hearing. Thank you to the panel for being here for your work as well. I had the opportunity this morning to be in Roxbury and talk with some seniors, mostly veterans, but there were seniors as well. And what they were concerned with is uh, potential budget cuts to seniors or to veterans. But one of the things they asked me is to work closely with my colleagues here in the city council to support our seniors. Um, during this budget process. So I, I told them certainly that's a top priority for, for all of us. Um, seniors play a critical role in our city, in our economy. They helped build Boston, especially during difficult times in the city when Boston wasn't as uh, financially wealthy, I should say, in it was a struggling city for many, many seniors, but they worked hard, they were determined, and they were determined to give back and make, make our city a city that works for everybody. So what, I, what, I, what I'm going to focus on is ensuring that we have the resources in the budget so that our seniors can't participate in various programs, whether it's nutritional programs, whether it's um, job training, whether it's supporting seniors that are struggling with um, income, um, ensuring there's transportation access for seniors as well. So here to work with my colleagues, work with the administration, listen, and to be as helpful as I can. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Flynn. Thank you to all my colleagues for their opening remarks. Um, and thank you, Chief Masso, Commissioner Shea. I'm not sure, if, do you want to start, Chief Masso? Yeah, thank Absolutely. you, and thank yeah. you for being here. No, thank you so much, and good morning to members of the council, esteemed members of the council. Uh, thanks to all of you and to those in the audience for being with us today. Uh, my name, for the record, my name is Jose Fabio Masso, and I am the Chief of the Human Services Cabinet. Uh, our cabinet comprises of six departments, including the Age Strong Commission, Boston Centers for Youth and Families, and Boston Public Libraries, all of which provide direct services and programming to older adults. Together, our cabinet serves thousands of older adults in the city each year providing services, connection to resources, and programming in every neighborhood of Boston. When you think of older adults, no doubt you think of Age Strong. You think of Commissioner Emily Shea and the leadership that she's shown over her many years of service to the older adults of Boston. And I'm sure you also think of the great team members she has, including Ty and Allison, who are here with us today, who look for ways every day to improve the lives of Boston's older adults. In a minute, I will turn it over to Commissioner Shea to talk more about all of the good work her team is doing. Before I do, I briefly want to emphasize that our whole cabinet is striving toward making our programs and spaces more accessible to older adults. In addition to Age Strong, BCYF and the Boston Public Library are working hard to better meet the needs of Boston's older adult population. At BCYF, we have added enhanced programming for older adults in a number of sites across the city, including the Mildred Community Center, as was mentioned, and the High Park Community Center. We will also be introducing swim lessons for older adults in Grove Hall in the next month. And at the Boston Public Library, we are adding an age-strong librarian for the first time ever. 
and we continue to grow our options for older adults like quilting and common square the number two lake group at the central library and our take home dementia activity packets in rosendale in addition we are certifying all of our library branches as age and dementia friendly with that I will hand it over to Emily to say more about the work that Age Strong is doing to meet the needs of Boston's older adults. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Chief. And hello, everybody. It's so wonderful to see you all. I really appreciate you elevating this issue. Um, and also, I, I think we probably have some older residents who are, who are uh, at home watching this. So. Um, really appreciate kind of everyone's advocacy around this important issue. Um, so as, as you know, uh, our team at Age Strong works hard every day to ensure that Boston's older adults have what they need to live and to thrive in the city. And that really includes um, many things, um, but definitely robust programming. Um, so we know that our older residents are at a much higher risk than the average resident um, to experience social isolation um, and that social isolation has the same health impact as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So it's, it's a big problem and it's one that we need to address. Um, isolation is deadly and we've worked hard during the recovery phase of the pandemic to restore social connection among our older adult population. We also know that our older adults are the fastest growing population with the leading age of baby boomers only being 78 years old. That's, that's, that's not very old in my book. It might be old in, in some books, but, um, and, and our fastest growing. So we're gonna see um, a significant population increase with older adults with our fastest growing population being that kind of 85 plus. And um, uh, Councilor Beard and I know you mentioned like multiple generations of older adults these are the things that we need to think about when we're thinking about our older residents is multiple generations, lots of diversity, and how do we meet the needs of everybody. Um, thanks to last year's investment in senior programming, and we very much appreciate that, um, this year we are doubling our events and programs team that supports this work citywide. We're partnering with BCYF to grow senior programming in community centers across Boston, and we're releasing, uh, and this should be done in the next couple of weeks, our third year of expanding engagement community grants that are focused on social connection. Um, there's exciting work that's happening right now. So there are three sites across the city that recently completed their first full year of programming. Uh, the East Boston Senior Center, um, which is run by my team, the Mildred Senior Center, which is run by BCYF, and of course, Barbara. Um, and uh, almost to almost completing their first year um, with an investment through a state earmark, the Ethos Pilot Senior Center in the West Rox at the West Roxbury Elks. Um, also, we just received a hundred and eighty thousand dollar investment from Goddard House to grow the infrastructure for creative aging programming across Boston, and we're going to be hiring creative aging managers. So we're, we wanted just to note that today because we're really thrilled for this partnership and to build on the creative aging programs in the city. Um, and we're updating our plan to provide coordination, support, and technical assistance to everyone focused on senior programming across the city. Um, and also working on a communication strategy for the programming that currently exists because you not only need to provide it, but people need to know that they can access it. Um, and as we're addressing present needs, we're also planning for the future. It's our goal to have every older adult to have access to the opportunities to keep engaged and feel a sense of community and purpose. To this end, we've engaged a consultant to help us create a strategic plan which will allow us to plan both for the short term and also for long term investments for people 60 and older in a thoughtful and equitable way. The goal of this contracted work is to move older adults as a whole um, and high need subpopulations of older adults specifically closer to the aspiration that everyone has access to and could participate in opportunities and spaces that nourish their social, physical, and mental needs in the city of Boston. Expanding programming, services, and spaces for older adults equitably is one of our top priorities. 
We have heard anecdotally that not all older adults living in Boston have access to the kinds of high quality programming and spaces um, that they need and deserve. Through this assessment, we're hoping to collect data, map our current investments, and think strategically about how to expand access as fairly as possible. We look forward to working with council and with our older residents and advocates to inform the process as it rolls out. And now I want to hand it over to Taisha Jones Horner, who's our Director of Events and Programs, to talk in more detail about the programming work that we currently do in Age Strong and the cross agency work we've been doing with BCYF to activate their spaces for older adults. Thank you, Chief, and thank you, Commissioner. Um, I want to express um, my sincere gratitude to the Boston City Council for inviting me to join this panel discussion to weigh in on a topic that I'm extremely passionate about. Growing up in Boston, I've seen firsthand how loneliness and social isolation impacts the mental health and well-being of my loved ones and so many others. I've also seen how access to meaningful, engaging programming can transform the lives of older adults by providing space to gather opportunity to form relationships with others, and even offer meaningful purpose to those in need. Today, I'm thrilled to share the incredible work our Age Strong team and partners are doing to engage older adults across the city. I'm genuinely excited about the work and possibilities ahead of us to create a variety of equitable access to programming for older adults in every neighborhood of Boston. This work also involves connecting with community and community to identify the types of programs and activities our older adults are interested in. We realize it's not a one-size-fit-all solution. The Age Strong Commission, collaborating with partners, organizes dozens of social events each year, St. Patrick's Day parties, uh, our Black History Month event, our volunteer recognition, and so many others. In addition, we know that ongoing programming is extremely important, and so there has been an effort to build that out in a more substantial way across the city. There is a lot of exciting work uh, going on in our city-run senior centers through Age Strong and BCYF in, in Brighton, Grove Hall, Charlestown, Mattapan, and East Boston. Due to its popularity, we have continued our virtual programs that we started during the pandemic, and with the support of Goddard House, recently added more great creative aging virtual programs. And we are working to enhance the in-person programming options throughout the city, including mindfulness workshops, lifelong, lifelong learning, fitness and arts programs. In addition, BCYF is in the process of building out senior programming in a number of other community centers across the city. My team is a partner in this work, supporting BCYF sites as needed. I'm excited about what is to come as we continue to build on this work. I want to spend a few minutes today uh, with one exam example to illustrate the impact of our programs. Bob Linscott, Age Strong's wellness manager, has led mindfulness classes addressing anxiety and loneliness, which have been magnified by the pandemic. Since the initiative's 2023 launch, we offered over 100 programs in 12 neighborhoods spanning senior centers, health centers, BCYF community centers, adult day programs, and Boston Public Library branches. We've also reached speaking Spanish, Spanish speaking communities in Roxbury and East Boston, a Cantonese community in South Boston, and Cape Verdean elders in Dorchester, serving a total of 600 in 86 unduplicated older adults across the city. I'm thrilled to be a part of, age, of the Age Strong Commission to work alongside some of the most passionate people and to serve such a wonderful demographic, 
our older adults. Thank you again for the time and for supporting our mission as a collective. I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Allison Freeman. Thanks, Ty. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for elevating this really important uh, topic. Over the past six years, I've been overseeing the needs assessment, planning, and partnership work at the Age Strong Commission, including our grant making. We've been talking about a lot of important things today, and you've heard that we really look at this as a puzzle. It is not only what Age Strong is able to provide and what programming our city partners, libraries, BCYF, and even police and parks co uh, coordinate. It is also all that our amazing partners do in the community. Our aging service partner organizations across the city help us to deliver and meet the unique needs of the many segments of Boston's diverse communities. We think about our work, our partners, as an extension of our own work and believe that each is an important part of Boston's older adult service network. We have to look fully at all of the work that we do and that our partners do to truly understand the very big picture of older adult programming in Boston. We fund our partners in two ways, through our Federal Older Americans Act funds, and more recently, through our city operating budget. Through the Older Americans Act, we fund 16 community partners, partners like Greater Boston Chinese Golden Age Center, Little Brothers Friends of the Elderly, and the South Boston Neighborhood House, and Viet Aid, to run group programming, like exercise classes, art workshops and other recreational activities, technology classes, and more. In addition, we have some specialized funding for evidence-based healthy aging programs like Tai Chi, yoga, diabetes self-management, and fall prevention, being run by partners like La Alianza Hispana and Ethos. And over the past few years, with Older Americans Act ARPA dollars, we've been able to support the expansion of much of this programming. We've also been able to significantly increase our work with partners through our expanding engagement grant program, which is funded through city, city operating dollars. We will be announcing this year's grants, our third year of this program, in a few weeks. While our federal funding is cost reimbursement and can be challenging for some smaller organizations, we like to think of our expanding engagement grants as low barrier grants. This year, we re redesigned the program with three tiers of grants in an effort to make the funding even easier to access for small groups with less infrastructure. We had 62 diverse organizations apply for the funding, which is very exciting to see. Thank you again for the opportunity to present here today. We are on the right path with this work, but we know there is a lot of work yet to be accomplished. We look forward to working with you, our city and community partners, and our older residents as we move forward. And we are happy to take your questions. Thank you. Um, so we will start with questions from my colleagues. The first round we'll do three minutes, and then we'll definitely have a second round. We do want to make sure we get to Ray Santos, and Barbara Cricklow will be the second panel zooming in. Um, so with that, I will go to Council Weber for his questions. Thank you. Sorry, thank you, Chair. Um, I guess uh, to, for brevity's sake, I, I just I'd like to talk about the uh, the nine C cuts and the state budget. I don't know who. Uh, okay, Commissioner Shea. Um, um, so, uh, just to walk through the the cuts, um, mm -hmm. you know, I've got a list. The first one is elder supportive housing. There's mm -hmm. gonna uh, it's a cut of two point four million dollars. Do you know, uh, so what is that referring to and then how will that cut impact services in Boston? Sure. So there's, a, so at the state level, there's a program called Elder Supportive Housing. It allows um, the ASAPs, the aging service access points like Ethos, Boston Senior Home Care and Central Boston to apply to then have uh, almost like a resident service coordinator, an enhanced resident service coordinator um, model. Uh, in a housing building, in a in a um, low-income uh, public housing building, 
Um, there are a couple of those funded in Boston, and I think there's, there's probably, I, I don't know the numbers, there's probably somewhere between 20 and 40 uh, buildings, resident service coordinators that are funded across the state. There's only a, a few here in Boston. Um, so that line item um, was uh, an earmark that advocates got into the budget um, to expand that program. And so there was no, there wasn't program expansion for this year. Okay. And then, so I, 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 do you know how many people we're talking about uh, across the city that um, the program? So, so, I, so what I would say is, uh, if if programs had been expanded across the state, they, the state would have figured out where to locate those. And hopefully, our Boston ASAPs would have put forward an application, and theirs would have been in the mix. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, and then so there's another cut of 2.3 million from uh, Elder Protective Services. Do you start with explaining what yeah, that is. Yeah, so, so sure. So, so um, Elder Protective Services is the program that people can access across the state um, if, if you are concerned about um, elder abuse, neglect, um, financial exploitation, a really important program. It's run in Boston by Central Boston Elder Services. Um, and uh, so there was a, a cut in that program um, at the state level. I think that, uh, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of the state, I think that they had done projections and they thought less money was going to be needed in that line item. I don't know that advocates felt the same way. So, um, but, you know, I think that what to note for that um, is that people should continue to refer um, cases of elder abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation, and they will continue to be investigated. Okay, and then it's the next one is home care services, which I, is that the home health aid? Uh, yeah, uh, so home care services are, is um, uh, the money, so, so that specific line item, I think, are, is the money that our ASAPs, El Ethos, Central Boston, and Boston Senior, who each cover a portion of, of the city. Um, it's the money that they have to provide in-home um, uh, pack packages for people, so in-home support packages. And so again, I think the state did a projection and didn't think as much money would be needed in that line item. I think advocates don't feel the same way. So, um, but, but um, there are some waiting lists across the state for programs like that. A lot of those are, are, have to do with workforce issues. Okay, and then uh, what, what is congregate housing? That's the next. Sure. Um, so it's again a, another state line item um, that supports uh, a, a, another model of support in buildings. Um, and there are, I, I believe there are two congregate housing buildings that are part of that program across the state. I mean, I think what we can note uh, on these programs is that, that the, there, there is a good amount of state investment in older adult work, that there's not enough investment um, in terms of the support that people need in buildings as they grow older, and, and more investment is needed in that area. Okay, just last quick, quick one. Sure. I, I'm over my three minutes, but uh, just the, the elder nutrition program, can, mm -hmm. can you explain what, what that is? Uh, sure, so that's the, that's the program that provides um, both Meals on Wheels and these community cafes that you see across the city. And I think if, if for folks that are listening, um, uh, uh, they can access these services, especially the community cafes, you can access for a meal for $2, um, a suggested donation of $2, so they're really important. Um, advocates believed that more money was needed for that program and were able to get an earmark in the state budget um, and that earmark was cut. Um, so there's not as much money, uh, there's not as much funding um, for that program as uh, advocates believe there needs to be. Okay. And just uh, that's in the state budget? Uh, that's on the state budget, yeah. correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Awesome, thank you. We'll come back. Council of Pepin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, thank you to the panelists for, for being here. My first question is regarding an actual building. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there, there isn't a senior center in my district. So I think my first question, and I, and I owe it to the residents, is there a plan uh, down the line to get a senior center in southwestern part of Boston, you know, but specifically in my neighborhoods, Mattapan, Hyde Park, and Rosendale? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, so, I, so what I would say is that's one of the reasons that we're doing this study, to look at spaces. Um, we know that um, we do need a plan. People need a place to gather and a place to go. Um, we do have a lot of city spaces that are underutilized for, for um, parts of the day. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we're trying to do with this study, and uh, Chief, I don't know if you want to say anything else about this, but because it's actually being run at the human services yeah. level, which I think is great because, um, you know, we all need to be thinking about this, like, like some of you are saying. Um, but uh, this, I think, will give us our initial look at kind of what spaces could be activated, how do we plan for that, and then how do we create the longer term plan, because a new building is, uh, is, has a long time frame and is expensive, and as we know, people right now need programs up and running. So for example, in Hyde Park, um, I know that um, we've been doing, Ty's group has been doing a lot of work in Hyde Park with some of the ARPA dollars that were put into the budget. Um, to try to try to get additional programs up and running with the with the High Park Community Center. Ethos has also been doing some work at the High Park Community Center that's partially funded through the grants that we're we've been that we give them. So it's it's kind of this puzzle. We need to get stuff up and running now, but we also need to and we need to look at spaces that can be activated over the next couple of years. But we also need to look at the, what the our long term plan is. Thank you. And I guess. I'll give you guys a little um, idea, maybe. So the summer school building will be vacant eventually in Rosendale. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's an elementary school at the moment, but they're about to merge with another school, and they're going into the Irving, the Irving School Building on Cummins Highway. So that building will be empty, um, and it's a city city owned building. So that could potentially be a site for a senior center. And then my last my my last question, if I may, sure, um, is regarding. Seniors that are interested in applying for those senior housing condos, um, I've gotten a lot of interest in them. And I know that, you know, specifically in Hyde Park and Mattapan, you know, a, they live in bigger houses and uh, many residents have, have expressed me, hey, interested in one of those newer condos where it's, um, it's smaller and they, they just want to live closer to the squares. Are there any programs that you all offer to help residents apply for, for those new buildings? Yeah, we do. Um, we do have a um, housing team downstairs uh, that can help that can help folks apply. I, I will say that um, our, our housing team is uh, focused on a lot of kind of crisis issues like evictions and uh, kind of working with the mayor's office of housing and with our uh, uh, we fund some work at Greater Boston Legal Services to to work on those kind of uh, really critical issues. Um, we also do help with um, access, help with applications, kind of as we're able to do that. Nice. Yeah, and I, I think um, all of those buildings have lotteries and we would definitely encourage folks to reach out and, and get connected to those lotteries. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Oh, it, and I'm sorry, can I add one other thing? I, I would just say that the Pride that's opening up has, I, I think, a 10,000 square foot um, senior center that's going to be in it, which is really exciting, and we're looking forward to partnering with them. Thank you for that. It's good to know. Thank you. Council President Louisian. Thank you, and I want to thank my colleagues for asking um, really great questions. I just have uh, three. One, if um, I know that there are grants currently, grant applications currently out. If you can tell us what the maximum amount that uh, an agency or an organization can receive from those grants. Um, the second, you touched on it a bit, um, and we've talked about this a number of times when we're talking about how to allocate resources. If you could talk about how an equity lens, a racial equity lens specifically, informs your work and how you allocate resources um, uh, on these issues. And then third is, uh, I, I'm not sure if you have it now. Um, we're gonna maybe have a, a hearing that's more specific, but those ARPA dollars, again, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that they're being used. I'm glad to hear that they're being used in my neighborhood of High Park. Um, but would love to get like, an accounting of what's left in that. I believe we bought for, uh, I think it's $125,000. Um, how much of that has been used? I'm just thinking about the advocacy that we've heard from certain mm. uh, from seniors want and want to combine sort of what's remaining with sort of what your what the equity lens is and also sort of what's open for the grants. We're trying to piece that puzzle together. For folks who are watching, folks who know that they advocated alongside my office for that money. So where does it stand? So. 
Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you for that. So the the um, top amount for those grants is fifty thousand mm -hmm. um, dollars, and uh, we, as I said, we had um, three kind of levels of grants. Uh, so we had under nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine, the kind of ten thousand to nineteen nineteen thousand nine hundred ninety nine, and then the twenty thousand. See, like my team, my team knows everything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for the ARPA dollars, I think we can get back to you and let you know there's a number of instructors, right, that are on the ARPA that are like, a, a, are coming out Steady. of the ARPA yes, funds. Yes, At Do Nazaro, you know? um, I know High Park, we have um, some art classes and some guitar sessions. Um, so we've been actively using that money um, to support these classes. But we can get back to you with an accounting of it, and I would say it was 100000 for citywide, 25000 specifically for the Nazaro, which is why there's some, some stuff up and running at the Nazaro as well. Um, and then uh, I would say in terms of an equity lens, I mean, I think we have to bring that to everything that we're doing. Our older, we have such a diverse um, uh, older adult population um, and growing more and more diverse. Um, and we want to make sure that, um, uh, that we're thinking about that as we're thinking about all of our work. Um, I think I've mentioned, I mentioned this in a, in a previous hearing, but um, we are really excited to be launching our community ambassador program um, this year. We just, uh, we just hired uh, the woman that's going to kind of oversee that work and we've been working with UMass and specifically with the, um, the UMass uh, Gerontology Institute and the Kanala, Kanala group at UMass which is um, kind of a, a number of their ethnic institutes. Um, they worked on an um, equity report for us for older adults in Boston and then um, based off of that work they did a number of focus groups with across diverse communities in Boston and um, that that work has is helping us to shape this community ambassador program where we're we are going to be hiring 15 people um, 10 hours a week from diverse communities to help us bridge to the community and figure out um, uh, how we can be communicating better um, both how we can make sure that folks are getting access to what already exists but also how we can do a better job kind of understanding community needs and kind of shaping shaping the programs that people are going to need in the future so um, so we're excited to to start that work uh, I mean it's only the um, I would say it's it's a small piece of what we need to accomplish. I just see tons of work for us in this area. Thank you. Um, I, Chief, was that, no, okay. Uh, thank you. Oh, Chief, please. No, yeah. no, no, it wasn't um, no I wanna thank you, Commissioner, and just wanna uplift Ronald Lamy, who's always working in partnership with my office to talk about making sure that we are, the racial um, equity lens is very clear on the work that we're doing for programming for our seniors. So thank you for, for those answers. And I hope that, you know, with the 9C cuts that we're able to take from that, like, all right, do we maximize how much a grant that someone can get? Do we look at what our opera funds are left over to support programs that people are really advocating for that I know that my colleagues want to see as well? Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, we've been joined by Councilor Durkin. Thank you. Um, Councilor Collette. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to my colleagues for asking uh, really great, thoughtful questions. I, um, I was going to frame mine around funding sources, but we've, we've talked about that uh, and was going to ask about ARPA, but thinking about any funding gaps um, and how we might fill them, just thinking about uh, how, how, as to Councilor Mejia's point, we are resource rich but coordination poor. Um, has there been any outreach done or um, interest from some of our private sector partners or philanthropic partners um, within this space? You don't really hear about certain foundations, I'm not going to name them, really getting into uh, senior care, but this is something that, of, of course, we're all talking about today, but is at the forefront of folks' minds as they start to age and thinking about my parents, but wondering if there's been any outreach done to some of our private partners in the business community or philanthropic organizations. Um, so, I, so I think that as, uh, as uh, Chief and I have been having conversations about um, kind of the vision for this over the next five years because it's one of their strategic priorities in human services specifically like as a as a cabinet-wide priority so we've been we've been chatting a lot about it and 
Um, we know that leveraging all of the resources and figuring out how all of that is coordinated is really the key to all of this, right? Because we can, we can leverage as many city resources as we can and as many uh, federal uh, and state funds as we can, but we know that we're going to need additional strategic partners to really make this vision come true. And that's really where, um, where I think um, uh, uh, with Chief's leadership we can, we can um, tackle that because um, we have partners like Goddard House um, who's who's been a wonderful partner with us and I think but I think we need more partners like that who are willing to invest and willing to take um, kind of a, a look at us across the city at all the needs mm -hmm. and I think that um, there's a lot of people doing this work across the city but that's one of the things that we can really um, be so good at because we're seeing the whole picture is really how do we engage these strategic partners and kind of leverage them um, across the city for this plan. And if, is there just a follow-up question on that? So there's so many long-term holistic planning that's happening in the city. Um, I know that we have a director of strategic partnerships who is actively working on this. Um, the planning advisory council Catherine Lusk mm -hmm. is the monorail between different departments trying to figure out what we spend our money on and that's more city side and city resources but um, would love to see because I think you just answered what you all are doing but would love to see a more coordinated effort with those mm -hmm. individuals to try to um, to try to just uh, get more investment into um, our age strong commission and through your your cabinet chief and then uh, my last question is just around transportation which we know is access and connectivity um, can you speak to what your budget is around that and if there's any uh, intention or efforts to provide more transportation for our seniors because as we know some of them do take the T but I didn't take the bus but it is really difficult to get the, to these places of community without uh, having a, a ride or, or a bus take them there so can you just speak a little bit to that sure um, I don't think I can speak to exactly our transportation budget, but we can get back to you with those numbers. What I will say is that we have um, 21 driver positions at the shuttle, um, as well as uh, kind of scheduling and support staff. Um, and that whole um, shuttle budget is funded through the city operating budget. Um, in addition, we use some external funds to fund um, kind of our taxi coupon manager who goes around to sell the taxi coupons in the city. Um, and we are um, with some of, uh, some of the money that um, council added to our budget for last year, um, we, or for this year, we are um, working to get uh, kind of a small ride share pilot up and running. So we work a lot with shuttles, we work a lot with taxis, but we haven't worked with ride share. So we're, we're, we're thinking about um, uh, getting a small pilot up and running before the end of the fiscal year. Melissa Carlson on our team has been doing um, a bunch of research work around kind of what other folks are doing in this area. Um, so uh, it's our goal in the future to um, be able to provide more rides on our shuttle, to be able to modernize our taxi coupon program, to be able to see where kind of ride share fits into it all. Um, we, we need to um, kind of, I guess, re-envision um, and create a plan for transportation for older adults. We know they need to get from point A to point B. We know that access is huge, especially for these programs and lots of other things. Um, and so we're, we're actively trying to figure out how we do it. Thank you. And I, I laughed out of, just really quick, I laughed out of relief and also gratitude because this is something that we've been talking about for how many years now. So just to hear that it's off, um, up off the ground is great. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Awesome. Thank you. Councilor Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all. Um, let's see, where do we want to go? Um, so I, you mentioned uh, city partners. I, I was wondering, um, as the chair of the pilot committee, um, I was wondering about are we actively uh, working with so many of our big nonprofits in the city, our hospitals and our uh, universities and colleges and nonprofit cultural organizations to develop opportunities for uh, screening and, and uh, medical screening or, or uh, preventative care, but also maybe lifelong learning opportunities to 
because um, there's so many folks uh, would bring a lot, you know, it's, it's a two-way street in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, having elders participate in a history class when they can talk about the history and they lived it. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering in terms of those sort of beyond the city partners piece, are we looking at, at partnerships beyond that? Given that we are yeah. we're going to hit a tsunami of ageing elders when, this, when the baby boomers all sort of start ageing, um, they are ageing now, when, they, when we hit the peak of that and then the next generation coming in behind, we've, we've got a lot to deal with. Yes, yes. The numbers are pretty incredible when I've seen them. I know BPDA is going to do a kind of presentation on projections on Friday. And I was going to talk about them today, but I saw the 20 to 25 number and I was like, I need to confirm that this is correct before I say it out loud. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think those are, those are critical partners. It's been it's been part of what we've been talking about, right? I think we need to not only leverage the, the funding uh, we need to not only leverage like partners that have funding, but also leverage all of those rich resources mm -hmm. that Boston has that you were talking about. The, you know, uh, we do. I would say we do one-off partnerships with hospitals and universities, but we'd like to be a lot more strategic about how we're how we're utilizing them and also uh, kind of leverage them uh, for programs across the city. Yeah, you know, this BC has their Center for Aging. You know, more looking at the financial challenges of aging and then you have the gerontology over that's more than the academic analysis but also thinking about just the cultural and enrichment opportunities that we have um, also the bcyf uh, we have one senior center uh, in alston brighton which we're very proud of and then we have one um, bcyf center um, which is moving to the high school uh, in the arpa conversation this is maybe something um, chief martos will follow up on um, we, 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 we put, we earmarked like we got a million dollars from ARPA to set aside to prepare space for the relocation of the BCYF centre uh, when it moved to a new location and I think we were landing at Brighton High School um, and I'm just wondering how that uh, money has been spent in terms of preparing it. I think one thing that the auditorium at Brighton High School is a space that needs some love and we were hoping that that would be developed as a community space that uh, you know senior programming might be able to be developed in, um, in a community space. I'm cognizant of the time, I have to run out of time. Um, also, I'm really excited, you were at the opening of the, the JJ Carroll building a few weeks ago, um, cutting the ribbon um, and, the, and the Pace Centre, I think that's a huge asset. Uh, but we have a huge demand, so I think it's all, all going to be used up pretty quickly. But um, the Pace Centre that provides uh, wraparound um, multidisciplinary care for elders, so mm -hmm. we're very excited about that. Um, anyway, just thinking about additional strategic partners and and all of the stuff that we're sort of leaving on the table. Let's, let's, let's maximize our benefits from that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Madam Chair, I'm conscious of run out of time, yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Have a round. Thank you. Councillor fernandez Anderson. Thank you. thank you, Madam Chair. Um, sorry, uh, Chief Maso, you mentioned uh, swimming lessons in Grove Hall. Can you tell me where? Sure, so out of the uh, Grove Hall Senior Center. Um, but the lessons. Oh, but the, oh, where the lessons are going to be taking place. Uh, so that's where the older adults will be coming from, but at the Croc. Oh, that's, so, oh, that's not Grove Hall, but. No, no, no. The, what I'm saying is that the older adults will be uh, transporting from the senior center in Grove Hall to the Croc Center. Okay. Yeah, so that's where it'll be taking place. Excuse me. I'm sorry if that okay, was Okay, I was like, yeah. I want to swim in Grove Hall. Where is it? <laughs> um, thank you. Um, of the, how many senior centers exist, do we know? Yeah, so, um, so there are four or five, I would say. So senior center, I think, is a kind of funny word, right? Um, Not the privately so owned ones, but the, there we, are, does the city own What them? I would say is there are, um, there are four senior centers that are, that are, there are four spaces in the city that are solely for senior programming. Um, there's a senior center that also runs at the Mildred um, a couple of days a week that started this week. So the Mildred so also has activities for up. youth, but it's a but it's um, but they're running senior programming during the day. Um, and then we have a number of community partners 
um, that also run uh, what they would and we would consider senior centers. Um, but they run them varying days of the week depending on the amount of funding that they have. And that's, so, that's what the study is going to show, right? Like how many partners, exactly. pop-ups, okay. And, and additional spaces. So, and I would say that a lot of our partners um, use our programming but also fundraise for additional programs. So like Chinese School Nature Center has two senior centers running five days a week. I understand. But ABCD and Mattapan run senior programming one day I a week. I understand. Thank you. Um, of your, like, so how far have you gotten to study and have you gotten far enough to know, you mentioned about who has access and who doesn't um, in terms of equity, equity uh, at lens. Do you know who has access and who doesn't? I mean, I think we could, I think we could guess, but the study is just starting so that um, they're finalizing their contract. Oh. Um, so they haven't started the work yet. Got it. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, and what were your budgeted recommendations to the mayor for this year, for the fiscal year 25? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I, because we are um, still building out Ty's team, and, and we should have that in place hopefully by the end of this month. I think she'll have a she'll have a full team. Um, and we think there's some, uh, we know that the study won't be done until uh, this fall. Um, and we think there's some external funds that we can leverage right after that to kind of kick things off. We did our um, budget investment request this year focused on um, the constituent services staff that would support the senior centers. What we're finding is that folks are going into places like the Mildred, and they're going for programming, um, but... Do you have uh, a total? Do you have a total? I don't. Um, you but, don't? But can I finish my... No, no, only because we get a little small time. Oh, okay. And okay. I'm only asking, like, quantitative okay. number, like, about quantitative... I don't, have a, I don't have a total for you off the top of my head right now. I'm going to be very interested in those details in the budget season, but I just wanted to have an idea like about okay. the number and in terms of like losses and in terms of like, you know, supplemental grants that you're getting, we'll figure that out, but I just wanted to know that off the top of my head, but if you don't want to share it, it's fine. Yeah, I don't I don't I actually don't I couldn't share it today. I don't have it for you in my head. Can I through the chair? Can we get that number? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then in terms of, you know, social isolation, you've named amazing programs, events, and everything else. So um, is there some sort of, like, quality assurance um, team or? Um, so we do, I mean, we do a bunch of uh, kind of evaluation work depending on our funding source. So I would say a, a lot of, for a lot of our external funds, we have to do a lot of data collection and um, uh, kind of quality assurance work for them. But what I would also say is that we just, we just reorganized. Within our reorganization, we have this new central team that Allison is going to be a part of as soon as we can get her out of her old job. Um, and um, in this new central team, part of what we're hoping to do is kind of a quality assurance program across the commission. So in its evolutionary process. It's growing, yes. it's gonna, yes. something's gonna happen. We're doing some now, but it's gonna be even better. Um, fantastic. Last question for this round, um, Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. Thank you. Um, an uptick in elder venereal disease, uh, testing positive for venereal disease. What, how are we addressing that? Um, it just feels like there's so much like pop up and um, transporting of seniors to different locations to get access to different things. If you want to go to this program, if you want to go to bingo, if you want to go to MLK, breakfast, like there's just so much transporting. It, right? It begs it, the question of for uh, recreational centers like, that are more yeah. encompassing an ecosystem or holistic that gives you all that in one building. Um, or multiple buildings in the future, so a need for capital investment in our seniors. Um, but specifically, I was very interested in that, and how are we addressing that? In in uh, in the capital, say, say once more. Sorry. In, in the capital, I went off needs all the way or to that, why we need. A but building. are you talking about like, like sexually transmitted diseases? Yes. Okay. 
Um, so, uh, so huge issue, right? Huge issue in older adults, and um, we've done articles on it in Boston Seniority Magazine. Also, senior center type spaces are uh, fantastic places to have people come in and talk about that issue and how to stay safe um, when you're older. Uh, it's not something that a lot of older adults have thought of, especially if they had one long-term partner. Um, and got married very young, and so it's up to us to be kind of elevating the discussion and making sure that, that people are getting the information that they need to stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Council of Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel. Age Strong and BCYF play a critical role in supporting our seniors throughout Boston. I want to say thank you to the team from BCYF and the team from Age Strong as well. And I'd also be interested in that study that you're doing, Emily, on um, you know senior centers throughout Boston as well. My question would be, what are some of the unique programs that you're that you have you're working on as it relates to public health? concerns for, and I know Councilor Tanya fernandez Anderson mentioned it, but public health concerns, challenges for our seniors, whether it's diabetes, whether it's um, various forms of, of, of cancer, whether it's depression, how, how are you working with the City of Boston Public Health Commission on a lot of those challenges facing many, many seniors in the city? Ready to answer? Okay. Um, so I think the first and foremost thing for our, our group is to build capacity. So once we hire on our team, we can get out there and start meeting with people in community. I would love to have a older adult summit to be able to talk about these different things because, you know, let's be frank, older adults, they're aging, but they're still intimate. Mm -hmm. um, so having a place where they have resources in one space we are doing our neighborhood resource fairs, um, and maybe we can connect with um, our different partners to bring in resources that touch on those different subjects. Yeah, and I would also say we, um, we partner with um, the Public Health Commission and look forward to growing that partnership with them as well. I know that they have a new um, focus on kind of a, a new lifelong focus. Um, that were um, that we've been talking to them about. Um, I will say one specific thing: we are partnering um, closely with them on uh, so the bold grant that they have, which is um, to create a public health infrastructure for dementia specifically. And we need to do more of that work because we know that um, uh, you know public health is not just maternal and child health; it's it should be across the lifespan. Thank you. I know it was mentioned here that South Boston has a growing Chinese community, and there's a lot of outreach to the Chinese community in South Boston. Many of them live in public housing, so I want to say thank you to Age Strong and to, and to the BCYF team. Um, maybe my question is to Chief Maso. Chief, what are we doing to support seniors in public housing that might not have the resources, the ability, the, the computer technology like other seniors um, to learn about some of the programming and accessing the program regardless of what, what neighborhood they live in? Sure, I'll tackle as much as I know. I am, I'd just be very transparent as we all know. I'm sitting with the, the experts in this, field, in this field, so I'm definitely fortunate to be able to have uh, a team of folks that are completely dedicated to this. Uh, what I will share, and just holistically, is that the beauty of Age Strong being in the Human Services Cabinet is that what I always like to say is that um, the work that we focus on is from the youngest to the oldest and everybody else in between. So, you know, from our youngest population to our older adults. With the question that you asked in particular, Counselor, um, I'm, a, that, I'm still going to pass it to Commissioner Shea uh, to talk about the work that we're doing with BHA and the collaboration that we have there. Uh, but you're talking about you know programs such as Tech Goes Home, um, the collaboration that we have there. Specifically, I can't ask, I can't answer specifically to the programming. Um, what I can say is that the outreach is really holistic from BCYF. Say strong, they're really intentional about making sure that we do the outreach to meet the needs of the residents. Um, 
per neighborhood. We know that each neighborhood has different needs and it's not a band-aid approach. And so we really wanna make sure that we're actually able to hone in and really focus on exactly what is that the needs are. And so if there's anything happening there, um, Commissioner Shea, I'd like yeah, you to elaborate. Yeah. I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make Allison talk since I've been monopolizing <laughs> the conversation. Um, uh, do you wanna talk about what LBFE is doing in BHA housing? Yeah, sure. Yeah, happy to. Um, so one of our uh, partners, Little Brothers, Friends of the Elderly, they are, um, they have a lot of great different programs. Um, one is around technology. So they partner with students who go into um, buildings and centers where older adults gather and um, work with them to learn how to use their technology and really um, increase their access to technology and uh, learn how to use their devices. They're also, I don't know if you want me to speak about this, but they also have a newer program that is all um, art related. So they're bringing um, art programming into these spaces as well. And um, yeah. that's been an in incredible program that's is successful. Thank you. And they're doing a lot of, they are in a lot of the BHA buildings and we're continuing to build out um, our partnership with BHA. Um, I've been we meeting with Director Bach to try to see how we can continue to support their buildings. Well, thank you um, to this panel for the work that you're doing. We appreciate it. More importantly, the residents appreciate the hard work your teams are doing. And, and just finally, um, Commissioner Shea have the, had the opportunity to work with you for many years and you and your team are very dedicated and professional and just want to want to say thank you. Thank, thank you, you Councilor. Councilor Mejia. Yes. Um, That's your, yeah. your turn. All right. What am I walking back into? Questions or yeah, final remarks? Three minute um, questions. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you. And thank you. And I know you were ahead. stepping out, so I have you back on the list. That's thank right. You. And I just for the record, I let everyone know that I had to step out. You did. Watch. Um, but I'm back. Uh, so I'm curious if you all can just, and, and I'm sorry if my colleagues have asked these specific questions, but I've gotten to the point where I just want to know what I need to do and what I need to ask for to help support you in your work. It's that simple. So instead of me saying, hey, I want to do this. No, I want you to tell me what you want me to fight for. It's budget season. <laughs> so I want to know what we need to do to improve the quality of life and programming for our elders. And what does that look like? So, so I think, um, you know, as, as, as I look long term and as we've talked about uh, kind of the vision for increasing programming in spaces across the city, um, as I look at over the next five years, um, we're going to need investment kind of in that programming and spaces. Um, we also are going to need investment in the team that supports that programming. And, and I was saying earlier to uh, Councillor Fernandez Anderson that one of the things that we're prioritizing in this year's budget is uh, kind of constituent services that can be there to support the programming that's happening. Because folks are coming into programming, they're bringing kind of their host of issues. And um, the team that's running that programming, they're not trained on benefits access or helping people connect to resources. So how can we also help to support that within those spaces? Um, and so um, I think uh, what you could do to help kind of any advocacy um, you know, over the next five years around those issues, or, um, or uh, we were talking earlier around leveraging external partners as well. So if there are external partners that you think want to be a part of this work to, to uh, make fantastic spaces for older adults across the city and everything that goes on in them, if there are partners um, that you can bring to the table, either um, on the programming side or the funding side, we would love that. If I can add to that, I mean, um, the external partners, I think, would be it. And so I, I'm really proud that this administration really prioritizes our older adults um, just across the board, you know. And so uh, in the Human Services Cabinet, this is a priority of ours as well. And as Commissioner Shea shared earlier, this is one of our strategic priorities. And so um, just holistically, what is that we're doing for our older adult population? And carving out the vision and what is that we see moving forward, knowing that 
uh, statewide, our older adult population is going to continue to grow. And we know us sitting at the table here as well, we're going to be older adults as well. So what are we doing to plan for our future? What are we doing to plan for the current generation, the future generation as well? I would say definitely that's it. But I think, honestly, I'm this administration has prioritized that. The external pieces and like establishing those relationships, I think would be key. And are you guys tapping into into departments for fun, to support your programming, like in the workforce development space, because our elders are ready to retire. They want to like have a little side hustle, because mm -hmm. they do. Um, so just curious about kind of uh, our violence prevention strategies. Like, how are you all thinking about interdepartmental um, supports? And then that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I would say we do some of that interdepartmental work now through our age um, through our age friendly program. A lot of work around city planning and trying to make sure that we're kind of elevating the needs of older adults within city planning. Um, but in our, uh, we, we recently restructured and in our, uh, when we're fully staffed in our kind of new structure, we're going to have a lot more capacity for those types of relationships because I think you're right, um, older adults don't just sit within age strong, right? They're across city departments, they're across community partners, and whatever we can do to kind of elevate the conversation around older adults when we're talking about workforce, when we're talking about the arts, when we're talking about our streets and sidewalks and buildings, when we're talking about our housing. I mean, it's, it's our job to be kind of elevating those conversations and making sure that people are taking our older residents into, um, into account. And I think that as people look at some of these new population projections that are coming out, that that's gonna also be helpful to the conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you for your work. Thank, Thank you, Councilman. Councillor Durkin. Thank you so much. Of course, thank you. Really appreciate, um, thank you, Councillor Murphy, for convening this hearing, and thank you to the lead sponsors, Councillors Weber and Pepin, uh, for your attention uh, to our senior population. I've had the chance to see Commissioner Shea and community um, celebrating Arthur Rose's 105th birthday party, and, um, and obviously uh, there's been a lot of great events in community, so thank you so much. Um, just wanted to highlight some of the uh, great work um, and potential, potential partnerships and current partnerships of the Age Strong Commission. I uh, want to shout out David Reedy, um, who does a great job at the Peter, Petersboro Senior Center and is a, a new uh, Fenway Community Center board member uh, along with me. And, um, and I loved the shout out for LBFE, um, which connects a lot of our college students with great opportunities to be with seniors and be in partnership with seniors. Um, I know there was a mention of transportation for seniors, so I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, I think that's part of what our link bus idea is trying to get at and part of what the city is trying to work on. We have the only operating link bus in Mission Hill, which connects a lot of seniors to basic needs like groceries and the library and, and other things. So um, we are uh, in the city is looking to expand uh, the link bus program. Uh, right now, uh, that shuttle in Mission Hill is sponsored by a nearby hospital. What if we were able to have those opportunities for seniors everywhere? Um, so, and then I'll shout out the work of the 55 Bus Coalition, which does an incredible job advocating a lot of seniors use the 55 bus. Um, and I'm hoping that when the MBTA gets back up to, to meeting our, our needs, and you know they're not expanding buses right now, but when they are, I think that's their main ask. And uh, I know the Age Strong Commission and some of your um, members have been at some of those rallies uh, with seniors who are advocating for the 55 bus. Um, and then just wanted to shout out, we don't have a lot of physical spaces in District 8 to have spaces with seniors, but there'll be a new West End Community Center um, mm -hmm. with the, uh, the uh, mitigation, or sorry, the community benefits for the Ragon building. Mm -hmm. um, and it'll be a partnership with ABCD and a community center. I'm hoping to see some age strong programming in that space. Um, and then we obviously have the Fenway Community Center, which again, I've mentioned, like you guys are already partnering on, along with the, there's Operation Peace, which does a great job in the community. Um, but just seeing that Age Strong is already, has those partnerships, I'm really grateful for everything you guys have been doing. Um, and just wanted to flag, 
obviously there are a lot of seniors who live in buildings, um, and I love hearing about the partnerships with BHA, uh, but Mission Park in particular has so much programming. I'm looking to go back there. I've um, been there uh, a couple times, but would love to bring an age strong person with me to try to even further those connections with RTH. Um, and I love hearing about the art stuff. Um, you know, I care a lot about mental health, especially for our seniors. Um, you know, I filed my first hearing order on mental health for city workers. And then I had a lot of outreach from communities saying, what about seniors? And what about, you know, the loneliness that's felt when, you know, members of your community are passing away and also, um, you know, lack of just familial connections as you age. And, um, you know, I think, it's so incredibly important that uh, the city really step up there and be a bridge for seniors facing that loneliness um, of, of what it means to age. So I, um, I love hearing about the arts, which has a huge impact on mental health as well. But um, I'm just, so I'll let you respond to all those things. Just wanted to say thank you so much for all you do in community. I know there's some partnerships in the West End uh, with, with the church over there and Father Joe and um, seen a lot of great partnerships in community, uh, but just uh, grateful, excited for further partnerships and excited to work with your office. Great, thank you. You just mentioned a whole bunch of fabulous things. Um, we recently met with ABCD about the West End Community Center, very excited about that. Um, we do fund ABCD North End West End and Operation Peace are two of our partners, and we funded ABCD North End West End to do some um, specific work in the West End. Um, in this last um, round of expanding engagement grants. Um, and then I'll just say, um, happy to go out to Mission Park with you all. We love our Mission Park friends. Um, and um, for uh, behavioral health, um, uh, the, there's an investment in our city budget of, um, uh, of uh, well, we have two staff that are focused on behavioral health. Um, internally, and um, uh, Bob, who's our wellness manager, who's doing more mindfulness types of work. Um, but we also have uh, $450,000 that we give out um, in community grants around specifically around elder mental health, and we will have that grant opportunity opening up sometime, Ali, in like the next month. Yeah, I would say within the next few weeks. The next few weeks? Oh, faster than I thought. I just want to say thank you so much. Um, if there's anything to add, and then I'll and I'll send my time back. But I want to make sure you guys have time. Just to quickly, I want to um, amplify that um, Bob Lynn Scott will be starting mindfulness sessions at the Weston Public Library um, from April 12th through June 7th. So, if any older adults interested in joining? Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilor Durkin. Councilor Wara. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to A Strong, and good to see Chief Mosso up here. But I just want to say thank you for all that you guys do in the community. Um, it was a great partnering uh, with you guys for the Love and Laughter Senior Luncheon at Prince Hall. Um, that was a success. My dancing wasn't all there, but um, the, 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 Nash, the treasures um, got, got to enjoy their time. Um, also, just want to give a shout out to uh, Alicia, um, who's always at um, we do different site visits as, a, as an office, and she's always showing up with my team um, at these different site visits for um, our seniors. Um, one of my questions is around transportation, because that's one of the things I hear about a lot, and I've advocated for this last year, and we've had discussions about transportation. Um, just kind of seeing you know, what progress has been made about expanding um, services, because one of the things that the seniors talk about is um, they get to their appointment and then, you know, the hours are cut off or they have to kind of reschedule their whole day based on the hours that transportation is provided. Um, but also um, the ease of using it, right? That was the other thing that they were pointing to as well. So kind of wanting to hear um, and I know we've spoken briefly about this, but if you could just dive in to not only the challenges, but you know, progress or your thoughts on transportation going forward. Yeah, sure. I, I, and Councillor, when you say ease of using it, are they having challenges using it, or besides the hours? Um, I think so I it's. Understand. I think part of it is if they have an early morning. Um, um, 
appointments. Right. So it's so hours. So it's okay. yeah, it's always okay. the hours. Okay. Yeah. Um, so so um, I will say we we hired um, we we are excited that we have an assistant director over at the shuttle. Um, we are working on getting our um, kind of four open driver positions um, filled and um, and starting um, uh, kind of some redesign work over there, which I know uh, you and I have talked about a bunch. We also, um, you, you weren't in the room when I mentioned it, so I'll just mention it here. Um, we also are working on a small ride share pilot. Um, so um, uh, Melissa on my team has been doing a lot of research to try to see what other councils on aging are doing around rideshare and specifically in getting people to kind of social engagement programming and senior centers. Um, and we hope to have that launched before the end of the year. So that's um, the progress that we're making. We know that transportation is a huge area of need and, um, and uh, you know, we've been, we have been going through our reorg. We are still hiring. I know I have to say this every time I'm here, so I'm sorry it's taking so long. Um, but uh, but excited to really be moving forward quickly, um, shortly. Awesome. And, and a timeline on the rideshare pilot, or is that something this year? Um, we're hoping before the end of June. End of June. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. We'd like if we could. We we want to use this year's operating dollars, so we're trying to. Move well, it forward. Thank you again. It'll for be all small, your work. though. Learning a learning opportunity. Awesome. Well, thank you again for all your work. You will. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Council Borrell. Um, thank you to this panel. I know. Do you have a specific question? Okay. Go ahead. Would do you also I before should. we go? Okay. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, you're That's next. Me, yeah. I didn't. I didn't see next. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I know we wanted to also but make sure we have the second th panel th but th before th they leave. Thank you, Chair. Just a, a couple quick uh, follow-up questions. Um, do do. You, uh, does any do you have the numbers on the senior pop-up center in West Roxbury and the response mm -hmm. to it and the attendance? Do I have the numbers on how many people are attending there? Yes. I think Ray is on the next panel and he can give you those numbers. I don't have the numbers. I know that it's been hugely popular. Um, Chief and I went and did yoga over there, um, and it was packed. I know it, and and what I will say is that every senior center that opens across the country is immediately too small for the people that want to attend. So I'm not surprised it's packed. Um, and you know, so is East Boston, so is Brighton. Every everywhere is packed. Yep. Okay, I was going to say uh, raise your hand if you've done chair yoga. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, uh, I, I haven't yet, but I, I hope to soon. Um, so, just a couple more questions. There's one: the senior shuttle. Um, uh, it, does it is it available to seniors for um, non doctor appointment visits? And if not, uh, can we expand that, or what's being done? Yeah, I think that's what that what Councillor was was alluding to. So, yes, it is currently available primarily for medical appointments for some grocery shopping trips. It is our vision. Um, uh, over the long term to expand um, where the shuttle is driving. We have scheduling software that we implemented just before the pandemic, which we need to kind of fully utilize, but we need, we need to hire for our drivers first so we have drivers to drive. Um, and then um, our hope is over time to look at both hours and also where we're driving and also to see if we can potentially leverage um, some other funding for it, like from hospitals. We do a lot of hospital trips, so we're trying to look at kind of where our funding sources are coming from as well. Okay. I'll just, I, I know my mom was being treated for leukemia last year, and there were cancer-related. I know the city had a program, but cancer-related transportation free transportation services and I, it was sort of like an uber or something it wasn't and they that i think the city could do a lot better job but uh you know sort of a, i think maybe look at that kind of program for, yeah uh the last question just um uh, you mentioned uh, uh, commissioner you mentioned dementia um are there any what's going what programs are available now uh what's sure. the plan for the future on programming for people with dementia? Sure. So we're working with um, the Public Health Commission to create a public health infrastructure for dementia. We do a number of memory cafes. There are adult day health programs if people need that kind of supported structure. 
Um, but, uh, and we, we have actually a dementia specialist downstairs, uh, Corinne White, who can help people navigate. We do a lot of partnership with the Alzheimer's Association um, and um, with Boston Senior Home Care's Family Caregiver Program, which is one of the programs that we fund through Older Americans Act funding. So I, I think lots of help out there for people, but feel free if you have folks, feel free to send them to us and Corinne can kind of help them navigate the system. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I know we're joined by Ray. Before we get to you, Ray, we do have um, Council Mejia has a couple more questions for this first panel, but thank you for being here. Council Mejia. Thank you, and Ray, I'm sorry. You're on Zoom, so that's what you get. No, thank you. Um, so I, I, I have a very specific question, and um, you know, I always talk about the importance of representation and all that good stuff. And I am curious, I believe Nuevo Dia is the only um, adult daycare for elders that is owned and operated by someone who's Latinx. Um, I, so oh, I think La Alianza Hispana. It's owned and operated by someone? It's a nonprofit and it's run by Marisol Amaya. Yeah. Um, and I know that Nuevo Dia has had a lot of fits and starts in supporting their programming. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious about what infrastructure and what role Age Strong can play in helping to support. Um, because I think that that specific community, because so many of the folks that participate in Nuevo Dia are language, mm -hmm. you know, they only speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. Many are, um, you know, immigrants, they uh, are struggling just to understand how to navigate. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious what type of programming and what types of partnerships are Age Strong, you know, considering doing with them to help strengthen them. Mm -hmm. You know, there mm -hmm. are over 175,000 Latinos that live mm -hmm. in the state of Massachusetts. And I have to say that they're all living here. But yes. uh, yeah. Latinos are fastest growing here in the city of Boston, and I want to make sure that we are being able to meet that moment and that capacity um, for, sure. for programming, particularly for Latino elders. And then I would love, and this is just something to share with Chief Maso, mm -hmm. because I am an ideas person, and I like to think about win-wins for everybody. There are a lot of high schools that are looking, well, if they shouldn't, they should, wrote like uh, helping young people get their licenses. Mm -hmm. I would love to see a program where some of these young people, not to say they're gonna be driving elders crazy, but that could help them. Like if there was a way to pay young people to do food shopping for elders, like what would that look like? This is just something for whoever's listening here and paying attention. This is a good way for everyone to do something to help support our elders and if there's a workforce development initiative where young people who have gotten their license can utilize that as a way to support our elders that's a win-win right just want to throw it out there for us to consider and then the last thing that I, I wanted to uplift and you know uh, Councillor Lara who uh, invited me to the West Roxbury hearing when all of the elders were there I recently went back at their invitation, and I was just so incredibly impressed um, and, and happy to see how those elders really organized and created a space for themselves. And I just wanna uplift that they need their own home. And it's great that the Elk um, Lodge is able to provide some space, but I know through her leadership, um, she, they were really advocating to have a permanent home. Mm -hmm. And I think as you're thinking about facilities, I, I think that there, I just want to uplift that leadership that she brought into the chamber and, and just want to say and lend my voice to advocating for a permanent home for West Roxbury. Yeah. Th thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons we're excited about um, uh, kind of crafting this plan for spaces across the city because um, it's definitely important that people have a space for sure. Um, Nuevo Dia does fantastic work. Um, we're glad to um, glad that they're an important partner in the community. What I would say is that Adult Day Health has their own kind of funding structure um, through the state. 
Um, and so, and they recently got new rates, which I was really excited to hear. I think, I don't know if you know this, but I started my career in adult day health when I was 18 doing activities. I then stood, uh, sat on the state commission um, around adult day health licensing and have done, done a lot of advocacy work over the years around adult day health rates and was very glad to see the state increase their rate so that adult day health programs can actually survive instead of just struggling day to day. I also know they were able to get their United Health contract in place, which is fantastic. They were working hard on that. So I, I think that there's a really important role for us to play with the Latinx community, both kind of um, uh, understanding what adult day health programs are out there and making sure that they get the support that we can give them. But also, you have to have a certain level of need to be in adult day health, a medical need. And so I think that making sure that we're creating spaces that our Latinx community can go into, can feel comfortable and can have something they want to do in their language, um, it, spaces where, uh, you know, senior center types of spaces, um, as well as having a good array of programs like Nueva Dia for when people have that medical need, we need to have that continuum in, in place. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. And I know that we have Ray anxiously waiting to go, um, but I, I think that what I have learned in my little short time here is that my, my job is to advocate for folks who are not here, mm -hmm. right? And I have a responsibility. My mom um, is still working and too poor to retire. But if she, uh, if I can ever get her into a place, I would get her into Nuevo Dia, not to give them a plug, but it's because there, there is something to be said about culturally competent programming. Um, and I think that as we continue to have these conversations, I, I think there are certain groups that are doing a really great job at making sure that we are doing programming that it reflects the culture of those folks who are in those spaces. And, and they're, they're doing, they're doing good work. Mm -hmm. And I think that they've had a hard time getting off the ground. And I think that the city can play a role in the future in supporting some of these folks launch more effectively mm -hmm. in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. And thank you, Chief and Commissioner and everyone for being here. Um, if you stay, we have two more panelists. We have Ray and then also Barbara Cricklow will be speaking. But um, we will turn over now to Ray, who is the Chief Development and Community Relations Officer for Ethos. And I assume you were listening in. We spoke a lot about Ethos and the great work you do, um, kind of piecing together the services across the city here. So um, you have the floor. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you to Austin City Council and especially Councilors Pepin, Webin, and Council President Louis Jean, um, and especially to Commissioner Shea and um, and Chief Masso for their testimony today. Um, my name is Ray Santos. I'm the Chief Development and Community Relations Officer for Ethos. Uh, Ethos is a nonprofit um, committed to improving the lives of older adults and disabled individuals in Boston. Since our founding in 1973 by a coalition of community activists, our goal has been to enable individuals to remain in their own homes for as long as possible and prevent the need for institutional care. Um, we want folks living in community as much as possible. Um, our aging and community, we do have, many of our programs are very well known, obviously um, home care, um, Meals on Wheels, our congregate or community dining programs, um, but I'm here to talk a little bit about our, um, our aging and in, in community strategies, including um, our Healthy Aging Program, um, JP at Home, and most recently our Senior Center um, Pilot Initiative in West Roxbury. Um, we try to bring programming as close to seniors as possible, utilizing all the venues and all of the assets available to us. Um, the Ethos Senior Center Pilot Program is a vital initiative aimed at expanding senior programming in Southwest Boston that came to life as a result of, of, of tremendous advocacy from seniors themselves. It's funded primarily through an earmark of uh, $250,000 in, in the state budget and while the city of Boston doesn't currently fund the city center pilot, the program does benefit quite a bit from other programs that are generally supported by the city, namely our healthy aging program, our digital aging initiatives, and our nutrition program. 
our longstanding collaboration has been incredibly successful, and it's a model for pro public private partnerships. Um, the earmarked funding supports various aspects of the program, including staffing for one full time person, a part time employee, um, the rental of space at the Boston Lodge of Elks, and I will say that they're very generous um, with um, um, the rent there. Um, uh, hiring of external consultants to provide exercise classes and activities. Um, and we're able to run incredibly lean in maximizing all of the resources available. Ethos supplements the program with additional programming from its existing offerings to enrich the seniors' experience. So we, we also offer 11 different evidence-based healthy aging programs. We provide a technology training program. We provide um, uh, we bring in um, subject matter experts on from our home care, our mental health counseling teams, um, et cetera, bring all the resources that we have to bear, not just the senior center programming. Um, as part of its nutrition program, Ethos also provides breakfast and lunch every single day that the program is open, and that's open twice a week, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, uh, with some a few sort of planned pauses throughout the year for planning. The program itself is, attracts a diverse group of participants. Um, over 500 seniors have taken part or visited the Senior Center pilot since we opened uh, back in early, July, uh, about the beginning of July. Um, we approximately reached a, a critical mass of about 100, uh, 100 seniors every single day, with more than 50% coming from outside of the West Roxbury area. Uh, seniors from almost every part of Boston uh, and beyond benefit from the program services and activities. Um, unfortunately, the state budget uh, earmark that funds this program was subject to cuts, resulting in a 50% reduction in funding. These cuts will significantly impact Ethos's ability to maintain the same level of activity and programming. Um, despite those challenges, um, we're committed, Ethos is committed to sustaining the Senior Center pilot program, um, albeit with some reduced programming. Um, I think it's important to note that, um, you know, something special has happened here um, as a result of, of, you know, senior advocacy, as a result of um, uh, our elected officials becoming heavily involved in, in trying to, um, and identifying the gap and filling the gap. Um, and this program has grown um, beyond all expectations. And I think it's important that we all work together as much as possible to, to sustain the program and find ways to make sure that it's um, that we, we provide continue to provide access to it um, for more and more seniors throughout the entire city of Boston. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ray. I'll go um, to my colleagues if they have specific questions for Ethos. We'll start with Council Weber, the lead sponsor. Yeah. Uh, th thank. Thank you, Ray. Um, uh, and I guess. Um, so I'm sorry, did you say for people who are coming from outside of West Roxbury to the pop up, did you say five zero percent or one five percent? More than 50 percent of the seniors who attend the senior center pilot come from outside of the West Roxbury area. And, uh, you know, so if the, can you just expand on if the, you know, the, the budget, the cuts go through without any other assistance, like how will that impact the programming that you're offering now? Uh, yeah, it, you know, the, the, it's a tremendous amount of work to run um, this program two days a week. So, and we're running it already with a very minimal staff. We have some volunteers that are incredibly important to the work that we do as well. Um, but the, we depend on bringing in outside consultants, outside instructors, many of them who come from the communities that we serve to teach classes uh, at the center. We typically have one class in the morning, one class in the afternoon. Um, with the budget cuts, those will be the first things that we are able to need to, we will need to scale back. So obviously we will help, we have to find creative solutions in the, in the interim to fill those times and fill those spaces. Ethos has a, a wide array of, of senior programming and, and evidence-based programming, but those are available throughout all of our neighborhoods that we serve. And so we don't want to cut, um, we don't want to reallocate source, um, um, resources from those communities that we're already serving, like Hyde Park, Mattapan, JP, Matt, um, and, and Rosendale. We don't, want to, we don't want to scale those back, but we want to figure out creative ways to maximize the, the time that we do have and be able to fill in those gaps 
at the senior center. Um, the, the first thing that will be cut, though, is, is our ability to um, um, provide additional activities. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, fr from the, the pop-up, uh, how has that changed your opinion or, or what have you seen in terms of how we should think about an actual senior center you know, in, the, in the neighborhood? Yeah, I mean, I think the city is doing amazing things. Uh, you know, it's, it, I will say that the city of Boston is one of the best places to age, um, you know, by, by and large. Um, the, the city is doing incredible things. And we, we coordinate um, quite well with our partners at Age Strong, uh, BCYF. I think what seniors, um, you know, what we hear from seniors is that they need communication. They need to know what, what, what programs and activities are happening uh, regularly. Um, they need to have uh, programming that's close, as close to them as possible. Um, you know, I heard transportation. Um, you know, over and over today, the transportation is, is, you know, one of the biggest barriers to accessing our programming. Um, during the pandemic, we were able to offer virtual programming, and, and that's still, you know, important, an important component of what we do. Um, but folks want to be in person. They want to socialize with their friends and neighbors, meet new friends. Uh, they crave connection. And so being able to provide programming as close to consumers, or at least pre critical masses of, cons of seniors, um, I think is really important to the success of any um, senior center pilot or senior center initiative. Okay, yeah, sorry, last, last question. Uh, I just, uh, I'm going to uh, borrow Councillor Mejia's question uh, you know, to the panel, which is, you know, how can we help you? What would you, if you, you know, you had one thing, you've got uh, the, you know, uh, the, the, the city here, all the, heavy hitters uh, from the mayor's office, um, you know, what would you tell us we need to pay attention to and, and fight for? Sure, I, I certainly increased access to programming as our, as our senior population grows, we're gonna need additional programming, um, not just in West Roxbury, but in every neighborhood of Boston. I think the, the um, you know, Health and Human Services and Age Strong in particular are doing an amazing job uh, in, in providing support to organizations like Ethos and so, so continue to support their work. Um, um, you know, certainly they, they know really well, um, not just from, uh, you know, what we're hearing from consumers. Um, for us, I mean, obviously any kind of support that we, we receive for these initiatives, I think listen to the seniors. I think that's the most important thing that I could tell you. Uh, listen to the seniors, what, what their needs are, are, are and, um, um, you know, think really well about how, how best to, you know, meet their needs. I know that, that you know, it's, resources are always going to be scarce. Um, um, but if we, if we listen to what the seniors want, um, I think it points really well to um, helps us create that roadmap for um, our planning and for filling in those gaps of services throughout the city um, and in West Roxbury and the Parkway area um, in particular. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman here. Ray, thank you for all your hard thank work. You. We really do appreciate it. I'm curious if you could just talk to us a little bit about some of your culturally competent programming. And I think about um, Ms. Barbara Chislow over in Mattapan and how she has managed to single-handedly get that place popping, if you will. Um, but I am curious as you as you're thinking about other spaces and places as we continue to be the diverse city that we are. Can you talk to us a little bit about what your diversity goals are and how your programming shifts to meet the cultural needs of our aging population? Sure, great question. Um, Ethos operates, so our senior center pilot is not the only program that we offer. Seniors are, Ethos offers more than 40, uh, I think it's up to, we're maybe up to 45 different um, community dining sites. And those community dining sites are really important. They're not just a place to get a hot, nutritious meal. They're a place to socialize. They're a place to participate in activities. We have staff that um, are active in planning uh, with the residents there uh, at each location, um, different programs and activities. So each one of them is, you know, in, in varying sizes, their own little senior center as well. Um, and each one is tailored to the particular community that we're serving there. Um, you know, for example, our Nate Smith House 
here in Jamaica Plain, you know, it's mostly, uh, you know, many Spanish speaking cons uh, consumers are seniors. And so the, the food and the programming is tailored uh, to that community. And uh, Saint Grandet, which was the first, um, first community dining site in Boston dedicated solely to serving the, uh, the Haitian American community. Um, we, the, uh, the, the food, the language, the programming is all tailored um, to serve that community. And then in terms of cultural competency, we, we hire from the communities that we serve. So Ethos is, uh, case managers, our outreach workers, uh, they're reflective of the, the, the consumers or the seniors that we serve, and um, they speak multiple, they're um, versed in multiple languages, they're, um, they come from varying backgrounds, um, so we really try to, to model ourselves uh, um, around the community that we're serving. Yeah, thank you for that, and one last question. I'm curious, you know, there's, a, we are in a state of, um, where people have very short fuse, <laughs> I don't know how to say, but people just like are conflict resolution and anger management is something that I have seen uh, that we need more training on <laughs> across all ages and stages of life. And so in particular with elders, um, particularly post pandemic, um, I'm just curious in terms of your programming, what, what has that looked like for you all? And if we're thinking about the long game here, um, and advocacy, particularly around mental health supports for our elders, how can we as the council help support ethos in their programming around that? Yeah, certainly. We have three, three programs that touch on those areas in particular. Uh, our MHOT program, um, which is funded by the state, uh, our elder mental health outreach team, and it, and it helps folks who are you know, really in, in crisis, both mental health and others and other crises. Um, our, our depression management program, uh, which is funded by a totally different stream, um, helps folks who have a mild to moderate um, depression and, and you know, need a little bit of assistance in um, sort of changing their outlook on life. Um, and that, that program has been wildly successful. Um, and then finally, we're, we're dealing with caregiver stress through our savvy caregiver program. So we're helping folks manage their their stress, giving them strategies on how to be more effective caregivers for their loved ones. And then finally, everybody at Ethos has to have a, a level of empathy and compassion. Um, we do this because we love to do this um, um, and um, because we love to work with seniors and we understand that seniors have uh, varying challenges and we, 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 we have, be patient, we listen and um, you know, we're, we're sort of, we're trained to do that. Thank you, Thank you Council Mayor. Council Fernandez Anderson, do you have questions specific for Ethos? Uh, for Ethos, no. Okay. Um, thank you so much for uh, your presentation thank you. and look forward to your collaboration, whatever capacity that we can assist. Thank, thank you. you. <coughs> thank you. Um, and I know you'll be staying on. Next, we have Barbara Cricklow from the Mildred Ave Community Center who will be speaking. Thank you. I guess it's good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, um, Barbara. Nice. Thank you for holding on. We appreciate that. Well, I'm retired, so this is what <laughs> I can do. But um, I do want to say the, the program was a necessity. Um, we have been trying to get something in the Mattapan area that um, could service a lot of people and uh, in various ways. And um, my friend Thelma Burns, oh, I don't think you can see her picture, but I have it in front of my computer every day. Um, she and I talked about, um, well, first of all, we used to call each other and say, what are you doing today? Let's go shopping, let's go to lunch. Let's, and then while we're there, we just talked about some of the things that we'd like to see in Mattapan. And, um, so we were out searching and people told us we had a rent, we would have to rent a space. We would have to pay um, to get a nonprofit status. We would have to do a whole lot of things. And at our age, we were just like, no, this is not, not for us. But we kept pumping, trying to find somewhere to go. And unfortunately, Thelma had an accident and um, she wound up passing away four months later. And at her, after her funeral, 
I was given a, a, a wellness call from um, Erica Butler. And she said, so what are you going to do about the senior program? And I said, well, it's going to be on the back burner for a while. And um, well, she asked me a lot of questions in less than 10 minutes. Where would you like to have it? Um, when did you want to have a meeting? What day, what time? And uh, she, then she said, I'll call you right back. Because I had suggested no to have, because there was a senior program there uh, run by Sherry Cope. And I was hoping that, you know, we'd get it again. And um, she, she said, I'll call you back in 10 minutes. 10 minutes later, she said, oh, your meeting's next week. And I was, I was floored because I said, oh, my, I said, now I got to get the commissioners involved, like Emily and Mara. And um, I wanted to get the elected officials. I wanted to get some seniors from Mattapan that talk because I didn't want us to sit there and nothing happened. And then um, a friend of mine, um, Rhea Thompson Warfield, she's from the, uh, the resource center, the Suffolk County Resource Center. She said, oh, can I come? And I said, sure. So we had a meeting the following week with the help of Aid Strong support, uh, supplying um, the refreshments and everything. Um, within two hours, we had everything that we needed except for the pool. Because the pool, with Mildred Avenue being attached to the school, the school had jurisdiction over the pool. So we started with um, oh, a wild staff, over, and I say wild, but it's so complimentary. <laughs> we have a staff over at Mildred Avenue that um, I think is the most important thing whenever anybody's working with seniors, you got to have the right staff. Mm -hmm. If the staff is not complimentary, and I mean like uh, accepting of the seniors and um, actually understanding that they're like a relative mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to... Uh, uh, how do I want to say it? You don't have to cow down to them. Just let them know that you respect them. And I, I see that, um, uh, and, I, and, and this is n not against Age Strong, but I think some of the staff that I'm seeing is very immature. They're young. And you've got to have staff that's comparable for these people. Um, when we started the program, within a month, we had 40 people. Right now, um, a year later, we have over 130 members. They don't come every day because we only operate Tuesdays and Thursdays, but they are there most of the time. And um, for programming, we were just fishing. Um, uh, BCYF was able to help us get um, an arts instructor um, I had a friend that teaches genealogy. He came in. Uh, we have uh, Tech Goes Home, and that has exploded, not only for the, uh, the knowledge of giving the seniors their computer skills, but now these seniors want to go further. They want to learn how to use publication. They want to learn how to... They just want to go further than what they were taught. Um, we also have mm -hmm. one, of, one of the seniors uh, is very talented and she's been willing to do arts and crafts with the seniors. We do uh, jewelry making, which has, I mean like, it's blown off the table. Um, we've, I mean, it's so exciting. Um, we had uh, dance instructors. Um, soon, I am not sure how soon, but we're going to have another visit by the Boston Police Academy. Um, uh, the door opened up for them to come and do, um, come in and talk to the seniors, and it was very, very successful. Um, 
a lot of the things that we're doing um, right now are actually answers to what the seniors want. And uh, we had a, a, a funeral director come in. Actually, he gave a presentation. We had a, uh, an insurance company come in to talk about home, ins I mean, life insurance and um, uh, those kind of things that they, you know, the seniors ask questions about. They're also looking for um, somebody who's going to talk about um, wills and trusts. Again, these are issues that they want. So basically, um, what we're doing is trying to find the, the, the people that will do this pro bono. And actually, eventually, it's to their advantage because um, the few presentations we've had, had, they've been surprised by the, um, the serious questions and some of the knowledge that the seniors have. Um, we, we try to have uh, activities like parties. Um, um, we had a, a party last year for one of our seniors that turned 102. And um, it was off the charts. We didn't expect it to be that way. But it, it was, and um, uh, it was very exciting. And every senior within the past year that was celebrating a birthday 90 and over, we celebrated their birthday. Um, and how we did that was some of the seniors brought in um, items. They brought uh, cakes. They brought in additional food that was served. Um, it wasn't like, um, it was like a sisterhood. And that's basically what we're calling it, a sisterhood. And uh, we do have some guys. <laughs> uh, we, <laughs> we have a guy that is, um, has picked up from Lauren Woods from the Boston Police Department and her walking program. She has that around the, um, the city of Boston. And uh, some days when she can't attend, we have one of the guys, he organizes the ladies and they go and they walk around. Um, we call it Norfolk Park, it's called Hunt. Uh, the Hunter Playground. But um, that's going on. Um, we're just trying to basically uh, satisfy the needs of the seniors that are coming to our program. And they do come from everywhere. Um, the city of Boston is, um, send, well, they don't send us, but I, I, I've seen this come from the city of Boston, and a few of them come from outside. But the activities, it's basically, if they want it, we'll try to make it happen. Um, we do have some issues, and I wanted to um, tap into the interdepartmental services. Um, I really don't think because almost every day we have a conversation, you know, like when they're having coffee and tea in the morning, one of the conversations is um, what is happening to Blue Hill Avenue, which has affected a lot of us, um, regardless of what part of the city we live in. Blue Hill Avenue is one block away from Mildred Ave. And if you're driving or walking or taking the bus, it affects you. And um, their, their concern is that it's not safe. And some department at, well, some departments at City Hall are not really listening to what seniors have to say about that project. Um, when you talked about housing, that's another issue. Um, some of the seniors own their own homes, but they, you know, they need the assistance of, um, so that they don't get uh, fines or whatever. Shoveling, raking leaves, um, trying to maintain their properties. Some of them, you know, they've, they've lost the partner. So here we have either a single man or a single uh, female 
trying to maintain those properties. Um, there's just so many things that uh, the seniors have issues on and that they need, they need that support. They're, um, they're I, I don't know how much more we can talk about health, but we've had issues. Um, we, we had an issue um, the, the day that the AT&T and Verizon was shut down. Um, one of our seniors was having an episode. Unfortunately, she did not bring her monitor that day. But um, fortunately, we were able to use the landline and be able to get an ambulance there. Um, we're considering taking the CERT classes that um, is being provided by the emergency management department because we just want to make sure that we're okay. Um, things that we have come up with did not seem to be on the radar of a lot of organizations. Um, like we have two wheelchairs, one on the first floor and one on the second floor, because we are on the second floor. Um, I've heard talking to other uh, senior programs, oh yeah, we don't have one of those. Well, you need to get them. And um, as, as far as funding some of our programs, I, you know, I mentioned it to a few other people, and they're, they're in the same boat we are. Programming for seniors, like arts and crafts, music, um, exercise, yoga, um, we have tapped into the Fit, Phoenix Fitness Center over on um, in, in South Bay, because they have a program that is virtual. So um, we've like uh, we've made it work. We've made it work with the help of BCYF. Um, some of the other things like transportation. Everybody talked about that today. It's really uh, a serious issue. People, these seniors want to go. They want to get to some of these locations. Um, a lot of my seniors now, they carpool with each other. Um, when they want to go somewhere, another person may be going with them. Either that or they're on their way to Mildred Avenue. And somebody will, uh, a group of them, will carpool and pick each other up. So it's kind of, um, uh, it's a catch-22 when um, some of the seniors are not available and that person has to take two buses to get to Mildred Ave. And there were quite a few of those that do take two buses to get to Mildred Ave. Um, but is, um, the other one thing that I really wanted to ask was, and I asked this before, we found a grant, but we couldn't apply for it because our program is part of BCYF. We were not able to get the grant. And I'm just wondering, again, if the city has a, uh, a uh, they don't have to be a grant writer because the grant that we're looking for, you don't need to write it. All you do is ask, answer questions. Money is very um, needed for this program and um, hopefully these, these issues will be addressed. And um, I also want to say this, there are buildings in the city of Boston that can be used for these activities. Um, they either need to be upgraded or renovated. And I think the program in East Boston, that building was renovated. And I think there are more locations where 
in these other communities that building sites can be renovated to service the seniors. So I think I'm going to end with that and um, answer any questions. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you for sharing out all how, how it started and where you are now. I was at some of those early conversations you had with the brainstorming of the space and then also the programming once it was up and running and the birthday parties are epic. But um, you're definitely a role model. I'm thinking as you're speaking that it may be a good idea for the council to not a hearing, but maybe just a round table discussion with people like you who have found ways to make it work and how can we access other city spaces to expand on the programming we need to um, currently. But as we know, um, we do studies with the BPDA about um, growth in our population when it comes to other areas of the city that we need to expand on and obviously we know um, our population is aging and we need to expand on the programming at the current level never mind as we have more seniors that will be taking access to these great um, programs but i will go to councillor weber and then councillor fernandez anderson if they have any specific questions for you Sure. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and, and thank you, Barbara, for all, all your hard work. Um, I guess, uh, you know, if, if we had uh, three programming areas that we could push for, you know, what, what, you know, what would you tell us that we should be focused on? Mm. Well, first of all, just like Aaron just said, um, ask the seniors. Listen to them. They'll tell you. Um, they, they will not hesitate to tell you what they want. Um, for our program, there's minor issues that we need to have addressed. Programming is the biggest thing. Um, and actually, ask the seniors what they want. Just like I said, uh, um, they wanted to have a, a, um, a funeral director come in. Wow, that was not hard. But other people thought it was a little, you know, outside the community, they thought it was a little morbid. But it was something they wanted. Yeah, that, that and, and talking about the trusts and estates, uh, you know, people also made a lot of sense and was, I, I don't know, not. I hadn't talked to anyone about that. Um, so thanks for um, that information. I think that's uh, incredibly useful. Uh, if you ask, they'll tell you, seriously. They'll tell you exactly what they want. Yeah, I'm, so I, 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 I'm gonna spend a couple hours at the Elks Lodge on Thursday uh, talking to seniors and now I know. I have my marching orders uh, from you, um, which I'll you know, be asking them uh, what they want. I guess just last thing, you know, we can we convene this hearing in part to see whether the city was providing services for seniors in an equitable manner across the whole city in, in a fair way you know we've got a senior center in east boston and brighton i mean in your experience do you think the city is doing a good job or needs to improve on on whether we're you know we're, we're applying or treating all the neighborhoods equally or you know what's your thoughts on that Mm, ask some of those folks that know me at City Hall. Um, <laughs> Parks and Rec, um, we could use more benches, lights, um, cut the grass, um, the streets. We, we have a lot of issues about that. Um, the uh, property management, yeah. We, there's just things that need to be done. Um, I mentioned, I said this at a, um, at a listening session before, um, the city can become a slum landlord and it's on its way because there's just minor things that need to be done. Um, just like in, in Mattapan, we have two pools we can't use. There was an article in the papers uh, last summer 
our pools were not allowed. And I know there's more of them around the city. Um, fix them. They'll, those aren't just for kids. Those are for families. There's, um, there are streets that need speed control, traffic control. Um, it shouldn't take that long. If we're asking for a speed hump, traffic lights, um, <laughs> listen and fix it. I don't know why we have to, you know, go year after year and we're fighting the same battles. It's not right. It's not right. And, um, you know, I, like I said, I found a grant, but I couldn't get it. $10,000. We could have used that in our program. I couldn't get it. Just things that can, things that can be done that, you know, like, oh, surprise. No, it's not a surprise. You know, and seniors don't ask for much. They give a lot. Um, this, I mean, look at Mass Senior Action was um, at Mildred Avenue a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they're, they work hard, a clear, clear across the state, they, they work hard. And it should not be a thing where the state is cutting the budget for the same people that basically put them in office. Okay, okay. Uh, th thank you. Uh, Thank you, Bob. You. Uh, Councilor Fernandez-Anderson. Um, Ms. Barbara, thank you so much for um, your presentation and testimony. I think it was a combination. Um, in terms of, you know, Blue Hill Avenue, I hear you loud and clear. We are in um, the midst of cre uh, coordinating with the administration, um, specifically with Streets Cabinet, to put together a listening session in community to talk about Blue Hill Avenue. Um, your, your grievances about Blue Hill Avenue have not fell on deaf ears, um, and the administration um, is, has communicated that they are willing to um, hold a conversation in community, specifically to um, address the seniors and small business. Um, so I look forward to being in that meeting. Um, you best to believe that I will get the information to you to make sure, to ensure that our seniors are present um, and heard. Um, I really, really appreciate all the work that you're doing and your courage and your uh, transparency in telling us specifically, hey, look, there are a number of things that the city could be doing to alleviate some of this beyond the Elder Commission, beyond this department. There are so much that can be alleviated. Um, I hear you loud and clear on parks <laughs> because um, how you treat me, right? How you take care of my street is how I viscerally internalize that and um, what I feel about myself. And so if, you, if, you, if I live in a clean street and I come outside and it's, it's clean, it's beautiful, then I translate that to how the city is respecting me. Um, and that's, that's just human nature, right? We all do it. Um, so that is a huge priority for me um, in terms of making sure that our seniors are treated with the utmost respect, that they feel loved and that they feel heard. Um, so I would love to, at some point, I know that you're not in my district, but um, please feel free. Like I, I can reach out uh, where we can talk more about some of these pain points um, in your areas. Mattapan is near and dear to my heart because I believe that because of the uh, lower socioeconomic class, um, or marginalization that's taken place. Historically, um, it's taking time, and it will take time to prioritize, equitably prioritize our most vulnerable communities, which is Mattapan. By far, it's not Roxbury, it's Mattapan, and then it's Roxbury. Um, although Mattapan has a higher um, home ownership rate, still uh, the poverty level is be below Roxbury at this point. Um, so I would love to have that, those conversations with you. 
um, in those little things that you're talking about, right? Like it's simple, right? Like cut the grass or clean up our parks or make sure the things are available. Maybe it's modular furnishing in our parks where, like you said, benches and other ways of making, feel, uh, making people feel included because you use these parks. So where do I sit? Where do I go? Um, and how am I supposed to be traversing these parks or using them amongst all this rubble and trash? And I see them. I walk through Mattapan, I, I see it, it's there, um, and it continues to be a, a, a bad habit that needs to be broken. Um, I appreciate you, um, Miss, Miss Barbara, with the utmost respect. Um, I thank you for all of your hard work, um, and I look forward to reaching out to you, and uh, hopefully we give you your flowers um, and continue to work with you collaboratively. Thank you, Council Anderson. Um, thank you, Mrs. Corklow, for your testimony. We are going to go on if there's any public testimony here. You can go to the microphone. You have two minutes. Please just state your name and your affiliation. Barbara, <clears throat> Barbara, don't go away. You're my hero. You are my new hero. Thank you for everything that you said, and that's why I'm standing up here right now. My name is John Provenzano. I'm from South Boston. I'm very, very proud of that because of the, the uh, programs that we have to help out the elderly, the youth, and uh, BCYF is quite a, quite a good organization for my family and for my neighbors. Um, the one, the one uh, question that jumped out at me at this hearing Obviously, I'm interested, you can tell. Um, Councilor Mejia asked a question that just hit me right on the head. She said, what should we fight for? And my suggestion would be, with all due respect to every councilor, that each councilor for a an important meeting like this, the hearing like this, that each councilor tried to recruit three people from their community to show up here, one way or another, to get them transportation to show up here. And out of those three people, one person could be the representative to face the panel, which I respect very much for being here. Thank you. Um, and have their question answered. And face to face, it makes such an important uh, feeling for, for that those three people can go back, those three people can go back and say to their neighbors, this is what they're gonna try to do for us, just by that one question that I answered. One question out of the three representing them, I think would be really important. Um, and, I jot down just one other thing because it'll never end. Um, in my years of union service and before me, there was a famous laborer that testified in front of Congress many years ago, and it was for an eight hour work week. And the congressman said to him afterwards, that me? Oh my goodness, I'm done? You're done, but, but finish, yeah, you can finish it. Thank up. you, Barbara. Um, when, the count, when the congressman asked them, okay, when we get this, what are you gonna do now? And the answer from the union officer was, more. And that's what these people are, are looking for, including myself, for my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, something more to make us feel like we're part of this community. And so that's what I'll, I'll end it with. And Barbara, if you ever get to City Hall, I'd love to meet you. Uh, we'll meet somewhere along the line. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Megan, for taking Thank care you. of my name because I didn't write it down. I'm sorry. But this brought it all about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Provenzano. Erin um, Murphy, I appreciate this meeting. Thank you. Um, closing statements to, for, to our colleagues. Do you have any? Uh, no, I, no, I thank you. I thank everyone for coming, uh, and, and thank you for that. You know, I think we do need more feedback from the community, uh, and I'll definitely take that, you know, into the next hearing. Um, and, and just, you know, I think we're all trying to do more for our seniors. Uh, and again, I th thank you for coming. And, 
uh, that, that's it for me. Thank you. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, any closing statements? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I have actually questions that I'll submit to you. Thank you. Um, and our attorney to um, the administration, if that's okay. Yes. Um, only because my filing was a resolution mm -hmm. and I would like to uh, pull it from Green Sheets and present a modified copy to give proper answers, accurate answers, and I look forward to communicating with your department um, to just get some more accuracy around what's happening in Roxbury and particularly in the need. Um, and I know that the needs assessment is still, hap is still to happen. Um, and I thank you for all your work. I do truly admire you. Um, honestly, I, I, this is near and dear to my heart and I feel like you're doing the, the, one of the hardest jobs in the city. Um, and I've seen you, Commissioner, like in the, in the weeds of it, and I've seen, I've seen you, Ms. Um, Horner, in the weeds of it, um, serving food with, you know, with your events, and so it's beyond just, you know, it's not a top-bottom um, approach, and I really appreciate that you are humble enough to do this job in this way with a lot of intention. Uh, this department is, I'm, I'm partial, but not. Um, I know that you know this. I'm very lucky to have Ms. Horner, and I'm so glad that you're there and bringing this, your perspectives um, and your genius. Um, but I, I look forward to getting those responses. I look forward to building up a resolution that looks more, um, you know, solid. Um, Ms. Barbara, uh, I will be reaching out to you. Um, you've, you've gained a friend, whether you want it or not. Um, <laughs> and uh, look forward to more collaborative work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. Um, and thank you to the panelists, Chief and Commissioner and H. Strong. I know all you do, and I think we had a productive hearing. Docket 0509, we'll keep it in committee. There's always opportunities to talk more about this. Um, but thank you, and I know we'll have more conversations when it comes to the budget. This was helpful. I know the hearing we had on the um, on all of the grants was also helpful about the transportation and all the services you do provide and your partnership with other agencies across the city and state which make I think your job even more difficult that it's not directly coming from your small but mighty office downstairs in the basement um, but thank you all and that docket 0509 is adjourned thank you thank you, thank you.